Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining this workshop. Uh, this workshop is accompanied to the 13th International Conference on Social Robotics. And as you, all of you may know, the title of the workshop is Social AI for Human Robot Interaction of Human Care Robots. Um, my name is Min Su Jang. Uh, I am a researcher at a national research institute called Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute in South Korea. And I'm happy to uh, be able to make an opening remark for this conference. Um, we have had several workshops with similar title since 2017. And this is uh, roughly the eighth uh, workshop uh, in this series of workshops. And the basic motivation for our workshop is to uh, share the ideas and experiences amongst participants with diverse backgrounds related to social robotics. And we wanted to encourage um, participants to explore how social AI for human robot interaction can be applied to service robots for human care in our daily living. And main topics of interest for this workshop include social perception and expression, social task modeling and user studies for sure and various applications like healthcare, receptionist, and education. Uh, today, we have four invited speakers who are widely renowned for their great achievements in social robotics. Um, invited speakers will talk about basic technologies like teaching social skills and recognizing daily activities and also general issues in uh, living with social robots in our uh, daily lives and also in the workplace. It will be very interesting. And we also have six papers for presentation like this. And this is the overall schedule of our workshop today. We will first have four invited talks, and then we will have a short uh, paper teaser session. And I guess that we will be closing our workshop at around 11 uh, in Singapore time. And actually, um, many of us are in different time zone. So I think it's okay for us to leave early before closing the workshop if you are um, uh, in different time zone and if you have anything to do, yeah, it's okay. And this workshop was organized by me, Min Su Jang and Professor Ho Sok An at the University of Auckland, New Zealand and Dr. Jae Hong Kim uh, at Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute of South Korea and Dr. Jong Sok Choi. Uh, I'm sorry, my face is occluding your information <laughs> at Korea Institute of Science and, uh, Science and Technology in South Korea. Okay, that's it for today's opening remark. And I hope all of you enjoy the workshop. Now, stop sharing my presentation. And Professor Goldie Neja, you can share your presentation now. And I will move on to the first invited talk by Professor Goldie Neja. I want to let me introduce mm -hmm. Professor Goldie Neja briefly. Um, professor Goldie Neja is a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial engineering at the University of Toronto. A major goal of Professor Nejad's research is to develop and integrate 
socially intelligent robots for assistive human robot interactions in healthcare facilities, private homes, and for high stress and dangerous jobs, uh, which is quite relevant to our workshop. And the title of the talk today is Life with Socially Assistive Robots, Intelligent Robots That Here to Help. Um, Professor Goldie Neja, please go on with your presentation. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Jang, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this workshop. Um, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So I'll just jump right into my presentation. Um, just to give you a background of what our research lab focuses on, we're, we're focusing on developing intelligent robots, and we say that they meet different variety of society's needs. Um, we want to develop robots that are intelligent, of course, assistive, and provide specific uh, service for specific tasks and activities throughout your, you know, your daily life, whether it would be in the workplace or at home, um, whether you're living in long-term care, nursing home, or in private homes, or re retirement homes, so different environments, of course. We want our robots to be emotionally intelligent, and I'll talk about this more in, in my talk. Um, we want them to adapt to users' needs, as, as well as their emotions and affect, as well as we need our robots to be persuasive, because they need to help people do certain tasks. And maybe these tasks are very important to their daily living. For example, taking medication is important for your health. So the robots need to be persuasive to be able to do that. And of course, our robots have to work in all different types of environments. So it's fun designing robots that have to go in cluttered environments with large disaster scenes, um, where there is multiple people, for example, um, grocery stores, where it's crowds of people that robots have to get around. And of course, they're cooperative. So they work with humans in teams, whether it's caregivers providing service to individuals or in a manufacturing environment when you're working side by side a robot in assembly lines. So just to give you kind of an overview of some of the applications we've looked at. So we do deal with unknown and cluttered environments. Throwing a robot in a new environment is important because you can't train for every single environment and have the robot learn that environment and how the environment looks like. So for example, you know, you're looking at flat surfaces here, all the way to clutter and th real 3D um, surfaces where robots are learning how to navigate. So you can see this little ro robot is slowly learning how to climb the rubble here. And of course, we work with humans, which is an important part of the workshop today. And as I mentioned, it could be collaborative tasks. For example, here it's a handover task um, where a robot is learning how to pick an object from a person, of course, and hand it over. And we try to do this naturally. We don't want it to be an odd way of doing it, right? So the human should naturally provide the object to the robot and the robot should be able to do the same back. And then since I mentioned we deal with environments with people, um, the robot has to find certain people in that environment to be able to provide them with maybe it's reminders of activities um, or to provide them with notification and so on. So they have to be able to move around, look in the environment, find the people they're interested in, find new people and add them to its uh, image detection system and so on. So it's a very important aspect of the interaction itself by being able to find users and interacting with them and know who the new users are. And as I mentioned, we deal with crowded environments. So Hello grocery and store honey. is a perfect example. Um, the robot has to go down aisles and it's crowded with lots of objects and products, but as well as people who are, you know, traveling down those aisles because they have their own list of products that they want to get with their own goals. And the robot has to be able to be able to move around them and achieve its own goals within that shared environment. So here's our blueberry robot trying to find products on the shelves while other people are doing the same thing. So this really focuses our research on designing the behaviors of the robots and the intelligence behind the decision-making that needs to happen when you're interacting with people. And one of the large cohort that we really focus on is older adults. And the main objective here is that we want to provide both social and cognitive stimulation to this age group, mainly to improve their overall cognitive functioning, um, their social functioning, as well as their affective functioning. And we think that this is really important to maintain independence, quality of life, and what we call aging in place. So if we can help them do these activities of daily living, then they can stay in their home longer, or we can at least be able to provide them with interventions to help them uh, meet their needs. 
So what kind of activities or tasks have we looked at? And we've been doing this for a few decades now. We've looked at, you know, essential activities of daily living, such as meal eating, meal preparation, as well as dressing and, and even clothing re recommendations from the robots, because some of us, of course, live in different uh, weather systems. So, you know, we have summer, all four seasons, fall, winter, and um, spring, and we have to make sure we dress appropriately for these seasons. Um, as well as exercise, which is important to uh, rehabilitation, as well as daily living and quality of life. We also look at one-on-one -on -one versus uh, group activities. We think it's really important to understand the dynamics of group activities versus um, having single robot, single user interactions. And I'll talk more about this, but so we've looked at mainly gaming and recreational activities and how humans um, or users interact with each other as well as the robots in this, these situations. So one of the first um, activities we really looked at, which we think is still very uh, important, is the meal eating activity. So in this case, we were looking at long term care homes where there's an hour each day set aside for breakfast, lunch and dinner, and everyone goes into the dining hall and eats. But of course, everyone has different needs. So some individuals require assistance with physically eating, right? Picking up the food and, and bringing it to their mouth and so on. But then there's that group of users that just need prompting. They may get distracted, um, especially people with cognitive impairments like dementia. And so they forget to eat. And then before you know it, the hour is done and they haven't eaten their meal. So could we use a social robot to prompt them and motivate them to eat. And of course, at the same time, if the idea is that meal eating is a social activity, we do it with our family and our friends. Um, so we want the robot to provoke, promote social interactions during the meal eating. And of course, important for distractions is we want to make sure that the robot notices or predicts that a person is going to be distracted and re-engages them in the activity. And we think that this is really important to having that group especially be able to still eat on their own before they have to move into the next stage, which is someone feeding them. So we want them to have that independence still. And so I'll just show you a quick video just to give you an idea what a scenario looks like. You can't see the robot here, but you can see how users are reacting to it. So this is, of course, our robot. Nice Please join me for lunch. Hi, Jamie. Today's menu includes some You can see there's a tray with which is filled with uh, sensors, which measures uh, how much food yep. is left. There's a side dish, a main dish, and then there's a beverage as well. And there's a utensil that the user will pick up the food. The main and dish smells amazing. And the robot tracks the food. In other words, you can't pick up the and food and try to put it in your lap or throw it on the ground. The robot is tracking to make sure that you bring it to your mouth. And these are important things because that's all of us in human robot interaction have seen people will try to trick the robot to see what it can actually detect and what it can't and, and what can they can get away with so it's really important for the robots to be aware of the humor the humans um, behaviors and their intent while the interaction is happening so you can see through here the robot prompts the user through the different stages of eating and the idea is you know it, it recognizes the company She's reaffirming that you know she enjoys having the robot there. It recognizes if you haven't. You should try some of your beverage. beverage. It looks refreshing. So it can it can prompt you. So it's again it's using that helpful. information from the tray to provide its prompt and the human behavior. And then in the end, you can also tell jokes because I mentioned it's a social activity and provide positive statements. And I'll end off with this one. I really like your company. I hope we can do this more often. I hope so. I hope I see you again. And you see, I never forgot your name. I remembered. And I was looking forward to meeting you again. So this study really told us, I mean, first of all, the feasibility of using the robot for meal eating prompting, as well as how people just in general, older cohorts uh, responded to a robot and had, had that one on one interaction with the robot. As you can see, they're, they're very comfortable. They talk to the robot, um, they provide actually positive feedback to the robot as well. So this really opened up a whole slew of different activities, the, the kind of the list that I was mentioning before. Well, what else could we have a robot help with? And what type of robots should we be developing? And, and you'll see as we go along, there's different embodiments that we've been looking at. So meal preparation became another um, activity. So the idea is we want to 
promote independence. So robots prompt people to do the activity doing yeah. it for them. Can you uh, lower the volume of the video because your voice is hindered is it too by soft? Uh, too loud. The video volume is too loud. So sure, is, it, is it possible for you to control the yeah. volume? It's, it's funny because it's in mid range for me here. So let me turn it down a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, let me know if this one is, is good or not. And I, I can always turn it down more. <laughs> So the idea is we want to promote so independent very loud, people to do very loud? Uh, you can control um at at the YouTube control. Oh okay, I think I know what you said. So it's only just this video is loud? Yes, video volume is very loud. Oh, was the other video loud as well or no? That one was okay. Is it the entire video or just this one that's loud? Um the previous videos were also had okay. Uh, a very high volume. Okay, so why don't I, I'm gonna control the, the computer's output and then uh, let me know if that's still, okay, let me see. If it's still an issue and then I can continue more. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea. So the idea is we want to better? promote independence. So robots prompt okay, people to do okay. the activities of living okay, instead of thanks. doing it for them. Activities um, such as meal so yeah, preparation, so meal uh, eating, and we're working here. on dressing right now, exercise. Robot that actually is used for showing what the recipes are. So you can choose your favorite recipe, then the robot will take you to the kitchen and you can start preparing based on the ingredients that you need. And this is important our we're social robots are back from the long term um, care when you're looking at de develop like actually preparing a meal to eat when you can still do that on your own, which is an important step right when you're living by yourself. Um, a lot of older adults that live by themselves lose the motivation to eat and prepare. The meals for themselves so they skip meals, which is actually detrimental to their health and overall well being so the robot can encourage you to eat at specific times and helps you find your favorite recipe so that you can make it together. And this is all to promote and encourage people to um, continuously eat and of course the, uh, promote their independence living at home by themselves. So what we wanted to do is we understand each user is different and um, their preferences may be different. Their obviously their cognitive skill level may be different. So we had a series of participants in an allied healthcare program in our university, University of Toronto, provide um, assistance to the robot by teaching by demonstration or learning by demonstration to actually teach the robot how it could help a senior um, living with dementia prepare a cup of tea. And we chose the cup of tea because it's a favorite afternoon um, activity for a lot of seniors in our long-term care facilities around two o'clock. They like to go and make a cup of tea for themselves and sit and read a book or maybe talk to their friends and so on. So these allied healthcare program participants were either in nursing, rehab sciences, occupational therapy, physiotherapy. And they came into um, a room where we had the robot and taught it systematically the steps of preparing a cup of tea. And then through that learning by demonstration um, scenario, we were able to teach our robot Casper, and hopefully this video is not too loud, um, how to prompt a senior or older adult to prepare that cup of tea. So here's a scenario Hello. where Casper is in front of the user. Hello. This is just My an introduction is scenario. Um, and then they're gonna, Casper's going to go through each of the steps. So there's a video that plays on Casper's tablet here. So here Casper's asking them to put on the water. Then you can see how she's been in contact and waiting for Casper to give her the next step. Fill in the kettle with water. And then you can go through that series of steps. And then eventually you're done doing it. And you can pour the water. So if the water is boiled, you can pour it in your cup and make it. And Casper's giving you feedback at each step. Great. And then you can go into that cup of tea smells wonderful. Like tea. So what we wanted to really see is if it's achievable to have caregivers teach a robot 
these behaviors because we think it's important not only as engineers and computer scientists to design these behaviors, but we want to personalize them for different individuals and make sure they're adaptable. So we want the caregivers who are with the, the older adults and residents on a daily basis to do this, right? So they can personalize for each user or maybe even a specific home has a, a very specific way that it does certain tasks. And they, they can take over without having the skill set of having to program robots, right? So what we also wanted to see was, okay, we have our Casper robot. It's a social robot. It has two arms that provide gestures and body language, um, a face that can actually display uh, facial expressions through its LEDs and vocal intonation. Uh, so all these combined together show the robot's intent. We wanted to compare how that differs or is similar to other um, devices. So for example, this is our Ed robot. And it's a character-like robot. It's on a Roomba base. So you can see the screen. It just has two different emojis that it displays on the screen. And then, of course, the tablet uh, version, where the videos of, of each of the steps of the tea making are displayed. And we ran a study where we had users interact with all three scenarios. And we wanted to see, was there any difference? This is really to make us understand if we need to promote not only the, the appearance of the robot being social, but also its functionality. So it should have you know, similar functionality um, as maybe humans or animals do with displaying emotions. So we found that Casper was actually more engaging and had overall positive affect um, for the users. And what was interesting between the three is that it also had higher perceived social intelligence. Just because of its demeanor, people thought it was more socially intelligent than the other two forms or devices. Um, it was viewed to be more likely to be included in social areas of a person's home. So if someone came over, you weren't, you know, you weren't embarrassed to have the robot, whereas the other two um, users wanted to put them in, put the robots in their closet or, or the, lap, uh, the tablet in their closet, and they didn't want other people to see it. So they felt comfortable with the robot, which told us a lot about the demeanor of the robot and how to design the behaviors of the robot um, and how people actually enjoy those social functionality and those social behaviors of the robot. So with that, we thought this is great because it, it tells us how um, people will actually accept the technology and interact with it. What about if we look at now from that one-on-one -on -one scenario to the group-based scenarios? Is there any differences? Do these robots help um, the group dynamics themselves, not only the interaction with the robot? And so we looked at two different activities, bingo, um, which is really, a facilitator such as a robot calls out the numbers and you mark them on a card. And if you get a line um, or if the full card gets uh, marked with the numbers, then you win bingo. And we chose this activity because it actually does have a lot of um, additive benefits. It improves overall memory, recall and recognition and your motor skills because you're actually picking up the markers and putting them on the board itself. And of course, trivia, which was a little different because usually you play bingo by yourself. Um, but trivia is usually a group activity. So there's usually two or more players playing together to win the game. And in each, in each of these scenarios, our Tanji robot shown here was the facilitator of the activity. So it was calling out the bingo numbers here, it was calling out the trivia questions and um, confirming if you, you've won. So the same idea of why we use trivia because it does promote memory. And of course, the social interactions between um, players or participants. And then we went to see, is there any difference between these two scenarios? So the one-on-one -on -one playing um, bingo or playing in a group-based scenario with uh, Tanji again facilitating. And we noticed in terms of engagement, they were pretty much close to each other. They were both 90 or higher, um, as well as compliance. And the only main difference we did notice was even though the users in the bingo activity you know, talk to each other. They were mainly talking to the robot or, you know, reconfirming what the robot was saying, similar to our meal eating activity. But in the group scenario of trivia, where they were playing together, they were more interactive with each other. So this showed that the robot was actually increasing their social interaction with each other. They would take turns, for example, somebody would say to the, the player beside them, it's your turn, why don't you press the the button to tell the robot your answer. So we saw increased uh, social engagement with each other, which we think is really important in robotics and social uh, HRI. It's not just the interaction with the robot, but the interaction with the users. 
In these kind of scenarios, we noticed a lot of difference, differences between other, other long-term care homes. So we did our bingo activity in two different long-term care homes, and we noticed that they actually play bingo differently. And so we wanted the caregivers again to have input in how the robot's behavior should be. So again, we use a teaching by demonstration or learning from demonstration system where the caregivers, again, having no expertise in robotics could provide input to how the robot's behavior should, go, uh, should be and what the robot should do. So you can see here, for example, Tanji's learning how to wave. In this uh, picture, ta uh, Tanji's learning actually to come over to Great the bingo class. players. We did this through a simulator as well as the physical robot. Yes. So here you can input um, what you would like the robot to say. And then the robot learns that through um, our learning algorithm. And again, this is important, like I said before, because each location that we went to had a different um, way of doing these activities. So we really want to adapt them. In addition to being able to give caregivers the ability to have the robots um, learn their behaviors, we also wanted to see if there's any difference between familiarity of different robot forms. So we looked at different devices, but what if you had um, a familiar robot versus an unfamiliar robot? Would people interact with these differently? And what if you also change their behavior to being a having a level of directness versus indirectness when the robot asks you a question or asks you to do something? And would that change how you responded to the robot? We think these are really important um, dynamics of designing robots' behaviors. So in, in this case, our familiar robot is the pepper robot and our unfamiliar robot is the now robot. How we decide, distinguish between these two was that Pepper would actually interact with people for 10 minutes, and it was a short duration of familiarity, and the now robot didn't have any interaction. And how we deciphered between directness was in the direct scenario, we, we had two scenarios where we actually had the people, uh, the robot asked the people to borrow their cell phone or ask them to instruct the robot to be more human-like. The robot would ask them, can you tell me what features I need to be more human-like? And the direct request, for example, would be, you know, can I borrow your robot? So it's directly asking to use someone's uh, phone, whereas the indirect request was, I really need to find a phone to make a video call and hoping that the person would offer their phone. And then we looked at directness and familiarity based on these two scenarios. We found that if the robot was indirect, so it indirectly asked these questions, it was more persuasive and trustworthy and people were more willing to help it overall. And the same was true for the familiar robot. We noticed that when the robot was more direct, the effect of familiarity was actually the weakest. So we really couldn't find that relationship between if you're familiar with the robot, you'd like it to be direct. That direct like style of um, behavior just didn't work either way. People found it to be more uh, face threatening and dominant than the indirect robot. So this tells us the indirect robot behavior is probably more appropriate for these social interactions or in the case when the robot is asking for help or asking for assistance for some, for some purpose. Um, so that's important with respect to the type of style to use. But of course we know there's a lot of other behavior styles that we can incorporate. For example, emotions. Um, robotic emotion is a, is a huge area, and so is user affect and emotions. And we wanted to see, you know, could we have people engage with robots, um, being able to actually determine what their robot's behavior int behavioral intent is, and how easy is that? And does it matter what age group you fall into when we do this? So I just want to show a quick video of uh, some of the behaviors we designed. In this case, you, the robot is actually dancing. We looked at a positive valence, high arousal behavior here, which is displayed through the robot's dancing. And the, the person is supposed to look at this video and figure out what's the emotion of the robot here. Then we did kind of the opposite of the spectrum where we looked at negative valence and low arousal. And again, the person uh, looked at the robot and tried to determine how the robot was feeling with an emotional display. And then we wanted to see, okay, were they able to distinguish between these two? So if you look 
at our results, we looked at a younger cohort and an older cohort. So the older cohort was actually from the long-term care home. And we wanted to see, was there any difference between them? And what we really noticed was in terms of the, the negative, uh, and negative valence and low arousal, older adults don't really find very negative um, scenarios or low arousal scenarios. They usually defined when the robot was dancing in this, uh, this type of style for it to be neutral. So that's interesting to say, and because this is called a negative to neutral shift in perceiving that ne negative stimuli. So what that means that they've lived longer, they've had more experiences throughout their lifetime. And so when something seems very negative to a younger adult, that maybe it doesn't have the same exposure to these experiences, they, they don't really think it's negative or really negative unless it's something extreme. And this is kind of the don't sweat the small stuff uh, uh, saying that we have, so they don't. And so there's a little bit of a difference when we find, uh, when we're designing things in terms of what we think, um, depending on what, which cohort we fall in, what is really negative and what is neutral uh, versus what older adults do. So we have to consider that when we're designing our robots, that there are some differences between these populations. So knowing that we trained um, our emotional classification system for our robot Pepper. Um, in this case, what we wanted to do was train so that it can recognize people's affect and of course display its emotions, not necessarily through dance, but through mm -hmm. um, behaviors using gestures and eye color. As you noticed uh, in the video, Pepper's eyes were green, the color around its eyes were green, when it was happy, blue, when it was sad. And we did this um, for an exercise session. So we took the robot to long-term care for a two month interaction period. So we wanted to do it through repeated studies um, and through repeated interactions with a robot. And we wanted to see, okay, let's look at two different scenarios. We've looked at the one-on-one -on -one scenarios already and the group scenarios already, but we've never brought them together. Let's do the same activity in either of these scenarios and see if there's any differences again between perceptions and how users feel about the robot. So here's our one-on-one -on -one scenario. We used an EEG headband, um, which we actually use the data to train our affect detection system from the user. So we were detecting their level of valence. Um, we also used a heart rate wristband to make sure as they're doing the activity that they don't stress themselves. Um, so we didn't want to put them at risk if they're having difficulties. And then here's kind of what our group activity scenario looked like. So there was about nine to 10 um, participants in the group activity with the robot. And so this was one hour session twice a week for two months. And then what we wanted to see is, well, how, how do the users feel about the robot? So when they interacted with the robot in the one-on-one -on -one session, which is shown here versus the group session, you see, you can see there's you know, changes in their valence, but in general, overall, they maintained a positive valence. And throughout the interaction, we wanted to see, well, is it feasible for, our SALT robot to actually you know, perform these or facilitate these uh, physical activities with the older adults. And we found at the end of the two month study that 56% of the older adults um, actually thought that their overall health was improved by, by engaging in these interaction sessions and exercise sessions with the robot. And we're actually motivated to continue the activity with the robot, which we think is really important because it shows the context in which these robots could be used for. The only difference we noticed between the one-on-one -on -one and group session was that again, they thought that the, the robot in the one-on-one -on -one session was more sociable and more intelligent than in the group um, session. And this could just be because they were closer to the robot. So they could see, um, the, you know, they had better visual focus on the robot versus the group session where there's lots of people there, um, there could be distractions. But it really tells you that um, regardless of the scenarios, we could still get the same type of output from the users. So in this case, we, we found that, you know, robots emotions are really important um, to, for engagement and prolonged engagement, of course. And so we, we don't, sh we shouldn't actually only focus the robot's behavior on, you know, the user as an input. We should think of the scenarios the robots interact with. So for example, in our diet and fitness council, um, counselor robot, Luke here, we had the robot design its behaviors based on the user. 
So if the user was happy or what the intent of the user was, the robot would adapt its, its emotions to that. And we used a hidden Markov model to do all this. But what we wanted to do was also have another layer in emotion detection or emotion facilitation where the robot also responds to other scenarios around it. So if you think about it, we have a two layer um, system in our own brains that take care of the deliberative layer, takes care of our decision-making. The reactive layer is really our stimulus response to different situations. So we designed the robot to have these two layers in it. And of course, in this case, it's based on the emotions and the emotional behavior. So our deliberative layer was that hidden Markov model, and then we had a reactive rule-based layer. And the main difference, like I mentioned, was that the robot's uh, deliberative layer was designing the behaviors and outputting the behaviors based on the user and the user's intent. And the reactive layer focused on situational awareness. So for example, the now robot in our scenarios was on top of a desk. So you can see here, because the robot is moving, eventually it could get to the edge of the desk. So what um, Luke would do in this case was if it recognized that it was too close to the edge, it would get scared and try to move back or ask the user to move it back. And we thought that this was really important and it actually created a, an interesting HRI scenario where it wasn't just the robot helping a person do an activity, but the person was also involved in helping the robot to really live its life and be able to um, interact. And we thought that that was an, an interesting element to social interaction with robots where we need to have you know, scenarios where the robot is also aware of what's happening outside the, of the user. What we also wanted to look at is, do we really need an emotional robot? What, what's the difference between a neutral and emotional robot? And again, what we saw was that the user's affect really is based on this. So in our, um, in our scenario of looking at the Luke robot, showing emotions through dance or movements or eye color changes, and then just having a neutral version of the robot that didn't show any emotions. We found that both robots could actually detect the affect of the person, so that wasn't an issue, but the emotional expressive robot actually induced more positive valence and less negative arousal through the interactions, which I think is very important for long-term interactions with a robot. So you can see here, the, the valence is you know, zero and a higher, but here you see that there's negative valence and this is the neutral robot versus the emotional robot. So I think that's really important with designing. So now we have robot emotions, we know what type of behaviors they should have, direct and indirect. But what about persuasion? We use persuasion every day when we interact with people, um, whether it's our children, you know, our bosses and so on. And we do them in, in different scenarios and strategies. So what about a robot? Can a robot have specific strategies to persuade us to do certain tasks and, you know, and focus it on the level of difficulty or the or the importance of that task? So what we did was we looked at different um, strategies, persuasion strategies, and two in particular here, the effective strategy and the lo logical strategy are two of the big ones we use as well. And we wanted to see, do any of these help in persuading people um, to do a certain task? And in this case, the task was counting how many jelly beans are in the jar. So here's a jar of jelly beans. Uh, Luke will try to persuade you to take it, his answer. Leia will try to persuade you to take her answer. And either one will use the affect or logical strategy. And this is what the two of them. My computer vision system can detect 500 jelly beans in the jar. So this is the logical, where it's saying my computer vision system can detect. It would make me happy if you used my guess of 1,000 jelly beans in the jar. And this robot is using the emotional, we're saying, where it's saying, it will make me happy if you do it. And so we wanted to see any differences. So we had over 100 participants interact with this robot. And what we found was that the affect um, strategy actually had higher persuasive influence over people. So they were more inclined to use the robot's guess of how many jelly beans are, are how many jelly beans are in the jar versus their own. So they would look at the jar, guess how many jelly beans. The robot would say, you know, I think there's you know, 200 jelly beans in the jar, and then they would decide, should I use the robot's guess or stick to my own guess? And we noticed that the affect strategy and the robot does, uh, using that had higher persuasion, persuasive influence. 
We then saw, was there any differences between age and gender groups? And we didn't find anything, but we did find a difference between occupations. So we found people in engineering, um, the physical sciences and businesses were more influenced by the robots um, than those in the life, science and, life sciences and humanities. And we think this is obviously, um, the latter are in the social occupations and in general, have had negative attitudes towards the use of robots, um, the whole idea, the concept of robots taking over our jobs. And so, and there's been just negative depictions for them and they haven't had as much um, exposure to robotics in the workplace, which we think is really important as we're designing these robots going forward for them to be firsthand there and involved in the design of these robots to ensure that we're designing the robots to also meet their needs as caregivers. Um, in addition to the residents and older adults we're dealing with. And I'll end off on one uh, last study. This uh, study looks at authority. So that's another issue that we should look at. You know, we've looked at persuasion, which kind of leads us to this. What about an authoritative robot? They exist, if you think about it. I mean, police officer robots, security guard robots, these are all in a role of authority. So how do we design their behaviors and should we be considering the same thing when we're thinking of healthcare or social robot um, and in robots helping us with different tasks. So we really, we did just a study where we wanted to see, you know, what's the difference if a robot is an authoritative figure or if it's a peer and do people respond differently in these scenarios and really what the difference between the two was where the robot stands relative to you and what it says relative to you. And we did this in a kind of interesting scenario where we took three very high um, cognitive challenging tasks where a user you know, may not get them right all the time. So they do require assistance from a robot or maybe some hints from a robot on how to respond or answer these questions. Um, and then we set up our scenario for the robot in an authoritative figure where it's on the other side of the desk and beside you as a peer looking at at the screen that you're looking at at these um, or doing these activities on. So maybe I'll just show you really two quick scenarios of it, just to give you an idea of what um, I mean in terms of how the map is an authoritative display is sitting across the desk seconds. in person. And we we'll use punishment or force during these activities. So the authoritative, authoritative robot would say, I will stations. punish you if you get the answer For wrong. Each trial, and everything is the last of robot to count the number of one of these symbols on the map. Here, the robot is providing suggestions. Um, so it'll tell you, you know, I suggest you go with this answer. So here's the robot in the Relative to the starting position, you, which has been marked by an X. And your response should come in the form of two coordinate numbers, a row and a column. So was there any difference then? Well, we found that um, when it was, an author it was presented the robot in an authoritative figure, it was less persuasive than the peer helper. So in general, people find the peer robot or, or peer acting robot to be more helpful and more persuasive than one that's an authoritative figure. We thought that this, well, why would, be the, why would this be the case? And, and we looked up back at the question of legitimacy and the idea of, is this a legitimate authoritative figure? Like do we, when we look at the robot, do we consider it as authoritative figure or no, or we're not clear because it's a robot? Um, so these are questions that we have to ask ourselves when we're thinking of the different roles that we're putting these robots in. Is the role very clear to the users? And we wanted to see, was there any differences between genders? Um, there have been studies in psychology, not necessarily with robots, but they've shown that there's been differences. And we did detect an interesting difference that we saw that aversion to the, the, persuasion, the persuasion of the robot um, was seen among male participants more than female participants. And the male participants found the robot actually um, being a threat to them in terms of their status or their overall autonomy. So they didn't like the idea of having authoritative robot telling them what to do or you know, giving them suggestions that they should take, but kind of in a forceful manner. So again, it opens up how do we design these robots, especially when we're looking at applications as in security and, and policing. And we have a lot of other robots uh, on our way, underway. We have a screening robot developer autonomous systems and biomechatronics lab at the University of Toronto. Social robotics as, as probably I am excited to come to Hong Kong to help out with the health screening process. The use of First, I'm going to take your temperature. 
restrictions because I will check to make sure you are wearing a mask. Contact. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to thank all my group members and of course all our funding agencies for all the funding support we've had throughout the years. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And hopefully the videos weren't too loud this time around. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, any questions from the audience? You can unmute your mic and you can ask a question. Uh, I have some questions. Okay. Um, firstly, thank you for your talk. It's really um, interesting, but very um, meaningful, useful study. Uh, so um, my first question will be, I see um, you mentioned some uh, two types of robot. One is kind of like emotional robot, and the second one is new natural or neutral natural neutral robot. Sorry. So, uh, can you kind of like make make it clear what what kind of like their difference in uh, in terms of their uh, their behavior? How how do you define okay one robot is emotional and the other one is neutral? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, in terms of the, you know, you have the same robot. So the main difference between them is they say the same thing. So their utterance is the same, um, mm -hmm. whether they're, you know, asking you to do an exercise or, or, or giving you a meal option. Um, mm -hmm. The main difference is the, the motion is kind of set out through three different avenues. Um, you, the color around the pepper's eye um, mm -hmm. is displayed. So for example, happy, as I was mentioning with pepper is, is shown as green, sad is shown as blue. The neutral robot doesn't have those change in color. Mm -hmm. Vocal intonation. So when the robot is happy, its voice is higher and oh. it talks faster versus sad um, when it's mm -hmm. slower. And then the body language. So like it gets excited, you know, it starts waving its hands up. So there's kind of the, the combination of body language, vocal intonation, and what these robots we call as facial expressions, what they can do because they can't really move their face which displays the um, emotions of the robot versus the neutral robot, which would just really just say what it, it, it wants to do without any changes in these behaviors. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, thank you. So uh, how did you integrate these three dimension like emotion together? It's kind of like role based or it's kind of like random. Like if I want to show the robot is happy, mm -hmm. um, do you kind of like program it to kind of like show eye color, body movement, uh, and the, the vocal together? Did you program it or? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a few different ways you can do it. Um, yeah, one is you could do a like heuristic uh, manner, um, which is rule based. Another way mm -hmm. is the, the learning from demonstration that I was mentioning where the robot learns from how users or people actually display these emotions mm -hmm. and and so it can learn how to do it so there's a little bit of flexibility there that it's learning from users how to display the same thing so That's those good. are usually the different scenarios so you can do multimodal or single mode and just focus on facial expressions or body language and then bring them together through a classifier okay i see thank you thank you so much um, thank you sorry my, my second question is I'm sort of like curious about uh, your study, like familiar robot and familiar robot. I see you you define or you use the pepper as a familiar robot and now as the unfamiliar robot because their uh, appearance is kind of like different as well as their head. Uh, I'm wondering, did you shuff, shuffle them? Like, um, so maybe in, in your first round, you use Pepper as a familiar, but in your second round, you use now as a familiar robot. Otherwise, I'm, I'm thinking their, their appearance can have some effect on your study result. Yeah, and that's a really good question because, yeah, you're right, their, their appearance could have bias. So, I mean, we didn't want to use two Pepper robots because then we thought it would be very hard for them to tell which one was familiar, which was what, unfamiliar. So we did we purposely use different size robots. So it was easy to say, okay, this was the robot that I'm familiar with because I interacted with it. This is a different robot. But like you mm -hmm. said, um, we did actually do a counterbalance where you know different users were, were, the Pepper robot was a familiar robot versus an unfamiliar robot for some users and then vice versa, the now robot. So yeah, you didn't have um, a bias towards one form of the robot. And that's really important, like you mentioned. 
because you can have your own personal bias just looking at the robots, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you for your questions. Um, as we are um, tight on timing, so thank you for your presentation, Professor Nejad. <laughs> and everybody can contact you by email for any questions, right? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, please do. And thank you very much again. And I, I'm looking forward to the workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you. Yep, we will move on to the next invited talk. Professor An, please go on. Yeah, uh, we're gonna move to the second uh, invited talk today. Uh, we're gonna invite uh, Professor Chen Min Wang. Uh, he got PhD from the University of Wisconsin Medicine in 2015. And he worked as a postdoc researcher at Yale University until 2017. After that, he joined to the uh, Johns Hopkins University as a assistant professor and working there until now. His research focuses on the designing and enabling productive and reasonable computing technologies to share the future of the works, living, and the care. Uh, today, uh, Professor Wang Huang will talk about modeling, learning, and tech teaching social skills. Please welcome Professor Chen Min Huang. All right. Um, thanks, Professor. Um, it's good pleasure to be here. Um, so let me share my screen and let's see if this will work. Um, and then play. Do you see my slides? Yeah, we can see your slide. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, thanks again for uh, having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Chiming Huang, I'm a assistant professor in Department of Computer Science at Johns Hopkins. So I, I'm just, you know, very hard to follow uh, the, the, the great talk that uh, the Goldie just gave. Um, so I'll try my best to just to, to talk about my work. Um, so just to set the stage a little bit. Um, so I know that most of the people here are interested in you know, social, social humor by interaction. So if you just want to put that into the whole spectrum of um, robots and humans, on the one end, we have robots that are mostly as passive tool, right? So for example, surgical uh, robots, right? People mostly just they operate uh, the surgical robots as a tool to perform highly specialized uh, tasks. On the other hand, we have robot as like autonomous tool where it's without any human interaction, just fully autonomous to do uh, a variety of uh, automation type of tasks. And HRI is sort of in between this, uh, passive interaction versus just fully autonomous. And this is the space where we are interested in to see how robots are going to uh, impact people's daily lives, right? So from education to older, uh, older adults care uh, to, to just generally service work. So myself and my group uh, in the past few years have been working in this space, um, looking at different aspects of interaction, um, for example, like physical uh, handoff, um, multimodal instruction of robots to do tasks, being able to uh, learning from demonstration, being able to edit our demonstration such that uh, we can customize robotics assistant a little bit more. Uh, also look at how can we use natural human behavior as a way to provide nuanced uh, information for robot learner. So these are a few different things that we have explored. I won't be able to go uh, into the details to talk about these different works. Uh, so I thought today I would just quickly highlight this but then I want to talk more about uh, some of the recent works that my group has been working on. Uh, it's not necessarily as mature as uh, other um, works out with it, uh, but hopefully that will give you uh, some sense of what we have been thinking about and also just get you know, feedback from all of you. So the way I, uh, I think about uh, this social uh, AI or social HRI is thinking about uh, modeling, learning and teaching, right? So if we, we need to model, how you know, people you know, use their social behaviors. Uh, we, I will use error awareness as a one example of this. We do learn from those uh, interaction um, and be able to generate that uh, in the robot actions. And finally, I'll use one example to, for robots to teach social uh, behaviors to human. Uh, I will contextualize that uh, in the uh, autism uh, spectrum disorder uh, therapy uh, example. But, 
I think this is sort of the, the kind of three phases that uh, require more work uh, and more effort in order to bring social intelligence into um, human-robot interaction. So I will start with uh, the first one, uh, modeling error awareness. Um, so the, the, the bigger picture is that you know, robot make errors, right? So it's not perfect. Uh, we are still developing a lot of technology in this space. You know, even though there have been some great um, advances, you know, they still make mistakes. So how can the robot uh, know that they are making a mistake? Um, so I think we, we, we think this is a key step toward more um, interactive uh, use of uh, robotic technology in everyday people's life. So to contextualize this, I want to use uh, learning uh, or programming by demonstration as a sort of like test bed to study um, you know, robot arrows. So I want to start with this, you know, dem providing demonstration to robots is actually pretty difficult um, for most people. Like even if you are uh, robotics, uh, trend, uh, you still, I think it's still you know, very difficult to provide a good demonstration just because of um, familiarity with the kinematics, uh, also just the constraints around the, the environment, around the, uh, the current technology, right? So we have been uh, looking into this problem of why it is so difficult for people to provide good demonstration. And because of that, uh, a poor provide a poor quality demonstration resulted in robot error. So these are sort of like a, very related uh, problem. Um, so, so with that, uh, we use this learning by demonstration as a test bed to look at um, social responses to robot errors, right? So when people provide a demonstration and then the robot uh, use those demonstrations to uh, recreate uh, a sort of a learn skill, but then in the learn skill, the robot uh, make uh, mistakes. Um, so what we learn is that you know, people respond socially to those robot mistakes. And that's the key insight that drives uh, this line of work. Right? So uh, we want the robot to be aware of that it is making a mistake. And the way we want to go about it is to monitor people's social uh, responses, right? people's uh, facial expression, people's verbal uh, um, response as a way for the robot to have this self-awareness of, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm probably doing something wrong. Uh, so I can either uh, stop or ask for uh, redemonstration or ask for clarification. So that's sort of the key insight uh, into uh, this line of work. Um, so we did a, a sort of pilot study to understand uh, what kind of behavior people show when a robot makes a mistake. All right, so we actually observed a variety of social responses from uh, su uh, surprise from, uh, to suspicions to just like laugh, just smile. Uh, so we see a variety of uh, people's responses. Even with the same person, we, uh, we see different responses uh, for the same person. Uh, in fact, we actually see an escalation of responses. So what I'm showing you here is a, a sequence of responses that we observe from one person, right? So from the beginning, uh, just like raise uh, eyebrow as you know, suspicion, to, um, well, this doesn't look really right. And then look away and start to smile and start to provide verbal comments, right? So there's this uh, response uh, escalation. So what we learned is that people do this all the time. Uh, and this kind of response and also escalation depends on the severity of the error. So if the error is very severe, people will respond very fast and much quicker. Uh, versus like, like minor errors, people will just like have, uh, like low intensity server uh, responses. So we thought that's interesting. Uh, uh, we want to take that uh, to the next step. Uh, essentially, we start, we start to do that collection and to see if we can uh, real time to detect um, people's social responses such that we can use that understanding to drive the robot behavior. Um, so uh, this is the current data, the current data collection, excuse me, that we are doing right now. Um, so we are we don't have any um, concrete results yet, but I want to show you some of the preliminary data that we collected. So we know that people respond. Now we're trying to collect data to build a computational model to help us to do this autonomously. So this is the setup. We have a robot and people just provide demonstration. And uh, you know, in this video, I'm, uh, I, I cut it a little bit so that it, it will fit the, the time. Uh, so that now is the robot replay uh, the human's demonstration. 
actually not request, uh, redemonstrate humans for demonstration uh, in, in two tasks, right? So the first one, the robots are going to, you know, did it uh, perfectly. And then for a second one, the robot will make a mistake. And we use uh, different uh, sensors, cameras to uh, try to track and then collect the uh, people's responses. So let's take a quick look of uh, this uh, interaction. So when the robot makes a mistake, people respond. Um, and people actually sort of anticipate that a little bit. Uh, this is uh, from the system side. We, uh, we had this, we would build our data collection system and analysis system on the Microsoft side. Uh, that's a platform for uh, people to do multimodal uh, behavior um, modeling and data collection. So it's the same interaction. Uh, we just show that uh, here uh, you have uh, the confidence level, like how confident we are tracking their faces, how confident we are extracting their uh, action units, their, their facial expressions. Right, so here you'll see, this is the, when the error happens, uh, and we are very confident uh, throughout uh, the process of extracting those action units. So we have a bunch of data like this right now. Uh, we are building a binary classifier to classify when there's no error versus when there's error. So our next step is uh, build that computational model and then uh, have the robot to use that model to drive their interaction, right? So when the robot detects there's an error, the robot will start uh, error mitigation strategy. For example, uh, apply apology or ask for uh, redemonstration. So uh, this is sort of our initial um, investigation into how to leverage humans' natural social response uh, as a way to understand the robot's internal, um, I guess, um, confusion, right? So uh, this is what we mean uh, by error aware. Um, so going on to the second, and feel free to uh, stop if you have questions. Uh, the second direction I want to highlight is uh, learning group awareness. And I want to contextualize this uh, in the uh, navigation domain, uh, social navigation. So uh, robot moving in human uh, environment is not a new problem. It's actually fairly old, uh, but um, we haven't seen a lot of uh, good sort of, um, I guess, quality of interaction yet. Uh, and part of that, you know, there, there are many different re uh, reasons. Uh, so in this, re uh, in this project, we look at uh, why uh, it's not particularly socially aware. Uh, and the direction we're going in is that a lot of prior work in this space treat individual pedestrian, treat individual person as uh, individual identity, right? So, but in fact, people actually move around in the human environments as a social group. So there's actually an empirical study to show that around 70% of people actually walk, uh, walk uh, in a group uh, when, they, when they move around in, in their environments. So we, we did some uh, data collection in our academic building. Uh, and most of the time, we actually see people uh, walking together, either just talking about uh, stuff after um, you know, the class or just getting coffee together. So we're thinking, uh, how can we uh, start to model this group awareness into the robot's navigation behavior such that the robot will not, for example, cut to the group uh, when navigating in the human environment? Um, so why we restarting this and part of this, you know, just motivate us a bit, you know, why we start to look at this problem again, just because, you know, in the, in the past uh, year or two, uh, this mobile assistance become sort of like re re uh, relief again, right? So we, we see a lot of major companies are doing um, autonomous vehicle to deliver stuff. Uh, last year, uh, October in Japan, they just wrote out this, um, uh, a mail delivery robot uh, on the bottom right. And part of that is driven by uh, pandemic. Um, and we are not just seeing this in the outdoor pub public domain. We are also seeing this in indoor environments where we see more and more robotic, uh, mobile robotic assistance coming into uh, people's life from you know, the uh, Walmart to a like, hospital uh, system. 
I want to play a short video here. Uh, this is my student uh, who went back to uh, South Korea this past summer. So just three months ago uh, in, in one of the restaurant uh, and seeing how mobile robots are being used in restaurants. So let's take a look at this. <laughs> So uh, they so order, uh, mm -hmm. the, I guess the restaurant staff will provide uh, dishes and the robot on the food they can So here's demonstrate a very complex navigation problem for for robot. Like there are people walking around. Um, I don't think this is particularly uh, a good environment for social awareness, but it, it's actually just show that uh, how complex the uh, indoor uh, navigation could be. All right, so how do we approach this group aware um, navigation? So we essentially took a reinforcement learning uh, approach to this. So we have a baseline, uh, which is fairly common approach is treat individual, uh, like I said, individual person as an individual agent, right? And the goal for a lot of prior work is to minimize individual discomfort, right? So try to not get, get too close to uh, each uh, pedestrian. But what we're saying is, you know, a lot of time people actually working in a group. When we recognize people are working in a group, uh, we need to treat them as one identity as opposed to three uh, individual person uh, in this example. So the way we, we, we go about it is actually very simple. We essentially compute a convex hull to represent the group um, space. And the goal is to for the robot to not um, violate that group space. So we essentially have this reward term that essentially discourage, for the, uh, uh, discourage the robot from going into that um, polygon space. So that's very, very simple representation of uh, uh, human group. So I just want to show you some simulation uh, data that we have and, and then provide, uh, show you also a robot demonstration. So on the left, we have this baseline that we treat individual, per, uh, individual agent as an uh, individual entity. On the right, we will treat um, group as a group. Okay, so the robot is the yellow dot, the goal is the uh, green star, and the other um, that are just pedestrians that we, we simulate. So you'll see uh, from the uh, left, the robot will cut through the group because the robot trying to get to the goal uh, as fast as possible versus on the right, uh, the robot will try to maintain that group um, space uh, and then going around. So here's just like static uh, visualization of that. Um, on the top is our um, the baseline. Uh, on the on the bottom is our group aware uh, approach. Uh, as I said, it's just like trying to maintain that group space by going around that group. So here's more um, numerical analysis. Uh, it's kind of complex. So let me break this down for you. So on the here we have we compared different methods. Uh, the SAR is the uh, sort of one of the you know, good. Uh, standard baseline out there. We also compare with social nice, uh, which is fairly recent approach that also try to keep this social awareness for the robot. We set up different configurations. We have different number of groups and different number of uh, pedestrians that we're simulating. And then uh, on the whole right side, it's like different metrics that we look at. Uh, I just want to highlight three uh, metrics today. Uh, the first one is uh, pedestrian collision. Right, so our group aware uh, policy actually uh, resulted in a fewer collision than the other um, baselines. And uh, in the middle is the mean pedestrian velocity. So the idea of looking at this is we want to have, like, um, we try to minimize the influence to the surrounding part, uh, pedestrians, right? So mean pedestrian velocity is one way to look at this. Right, so if the pedestrian velocity is not reduced too much, that means the robot has less influence on them, right? So uh, here to show you that our group awareness uh, essentially uh, put uh, less uh, influence on those uh, surrounding people. 
On the right is a group uh, intersection. Uh, and this is exactly what we're trying to optimize for. Uh, so not surprisingly, uh, the group aware policy cuts through the group uh, less often compared to the other so quote unquote social aware uh, policy. Right, so if we just consider social awareness without a group, then naturally they will uh, from time to time cut through the social group. So here uh, we provide robot demonstration. We ported our learn policy to the physical uh, robot. Uh, here we use a spot robot uh, and then just dem demonstrate what it would look like uh, in real life. All right, so um, a team of two coming across. So this is obviously a simulated setup. It's not necessarily uh, realistic in the real uh, environment, but it is show you that the robot will try to um, uh, keep that group uh, together. So here we have a, a bit more complex. We have a few different groups um, going through and the robot just trying to do not cut through those groups, right? And then find, okay, there's a space between these two groups and the robot will walk through that space. Yeah, so that was uh, learning uh, a policy uh, for uh, group awareness. And um, we, we think that's, uh, that's important uh, when it comes to uh, indoor navigation, uh, when we bring more and more robotic assistance to, uh, to people. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, teaching social communication. And this is uh, contextualized in more uh, socially, uh, socially uh, assistive robotics uh, domain. Uh, we look at uh, social robots to, um, to provide various uh, behavioral therapy to uh, special needs population. Um, in this particular work, we look at uh, children with autism and try to motivate this a little bit. Uh, let's watch this uh, CNN uh, footage for uh, robots for autism. Children with autism often have a hard time talking with or even looking at human therapists like this boy. But look at how he lights up with Milo. We found that. So over the years, we have seen um, growing evidence that uh, children with autism um, respond more positively to uh, robots, to computers than uh, humans. Right? So uh, there's uh, a lot of work going to this. How can we leverage social robots as a way to provide um, behaviors, uh, emo uh, social communicational or behavioral um, therapy, right? So robots could be a way to model good behavior. And so that's what exactly we, uh, we did uh, in this project. Uh, so we had uh, this setup where we tried, uh, we, our goal is to deploy this system to people's home for 30 days um, to, to see if we can see a longer term uh, benefit of, of this kind of behavioral therapy. Because before we, most people just do uh, in the lab uh, short, um, sessions, uh, we see interesting behavior, but it's unclear if over a longer period of time, will those behavior uh, be more obvious and more sustainable. So we are trying to build this system that can, uh, that can be deployed. Uh, and if you work any like real robotic system, you know it's actually very difficult to uh, build autonomous systems that can put into people's house for, for a long period of time. Um, but I just want to show you some of the basic functionality that we build into this uh, robotic system. We have this big uh, touch screen that we will show educational content, uh, the, the child, the family member can interact with. Uh, on the other side, we have a social robot that can engage the, um, uh, the person. And we also have a, a perception systems that we keep track of their face, uh, where they are looking at, uh, just because that's sort of the key sort of social um, skills that we are targeting, like joint attention. So here's some demonstration of uh, basic face tracking. Uh, as the person move around, the, the robot try to maintain eye contact. As the person uh, look at the screen, the robot will look at the screen as if it is sharing uh, the attention. So these two are the sort of the core social skills that we build into the robot. Uh, and on top of these two, core social skills, we build uh, essentially a set of um, like therapeutic uh, contents that they can interact with. So the goal here is 
put the robot system into people's home for 30 days. Each day they will interact for 30 minutes um, and play three games. So I'm just going to play this video to uh, give you some sense of what the interaction looks like. Hopefully it's not too loud. Um, so, uh, so this is what they, what they will do uh, every day. They will turn on the computer, everything was set up. Uh, they will just need to click through a few things. Uh, the robot will motivate each day's section by providing a backstory, give the, the child a little bit of motivation and the child and will select three games to play with uh, the, the robot. So let's take a look. Yay, hi Eliza. It was really hard leaving my family a few days ago when I had to board my spaceship. Goodbyes can be really sad. I held on tight to prepare for landing. Then I heard my spaceship splash into the water and I opened my eyes. Looking around, I could see that I was safe and okay. And I could see that I had safely landed on the beautiful planet Earth. Each day I will have some games to play. If we work together and finish all the day's activities, I will earn back a piece of my gear. Thank you so much for helping me fix my space gear. I'm really excited to play. Which game would you like to play first today? So we randomly uh, decide nice three games. Let me get the game ready. Very cool. So uh, as the, the child play the game uh, with the, uh, the caregiver, the robot will provide feedback, model, good behavior. For example, uh, some of the game involves the interaction between the child and the caregiver. The robot will essentially facilitate that uh, joint attention between, uh, between the two. Uh, so we put these systems out for, I believe, uh, 14 or 11 family. Uh, I don't remember exactly, 14 or 11. Um, you know, and then it, the, the challenge is like every home is very different. Uh, one of the home that we went to, actually the first home we went into uh, had this um, very themed environment because the child was um, very sensitive to the light uh, and that themed environment just break uh, all our uh, perception systems. Um, so it's just very fun to, um, you know, it, I think it's good to put the system out there in the real world it's also very fun to learn that, you know, how um, different environments, different families uh, present unique opportunity for us to just to adapt. Um, and that just like generally, uh, I think uh, for our community to go in for war is how do we personalize, how do we adapt uh, to individual environment, to individual needs. Uh, nonetheless, uh, here are some quick results from this study. Uh, on the left, uh, this is the sort of a typical uh, interaction look like. So this is from the one of the camera. Um, so if you remember, uh, we have this two camera system um, in the back, just as a way to track their uh, behavior so that the robot can respond. Uh, the other camera just for recording. Uh, so that this is what from the camera view look like. So we have a child, we have a caregiver and uh, the robot essentially facilitate this uh, interaction. On the right is our results. So uh, the main result is our uh, joint attention uh, metrics. Uh, we did uh, four um, assessment, right? So day zero is the day that we went in to deploy the system, right? So before day zero, uh, we uh, did once, like, you know, negative, negative, uh, negative 30 days, excuse me. So we did one. And day zero, we went in, we did, an, uh, we did another an, an, uh, assessment. We put the robot there for 30 days. And then on day 30, when we uh, took out the robot, we also do another assessment. Uh, plus another 30, day 60, we, uh, we did another assessment. Uh, so we see if, there, if, see if there's any um, assessment change uh, and how, how, how was that sustained. So essentially we saw that uh, from day zero to day 30, there was improvement. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that improvement did not sustain uh, after another 30 days, right? So this just opens up a lot of opportunity to uh, look further, like right? how long is long enough, right? How, how long should we deploy a system in order to see a much longer sustained uh, benefit to, uh, to the child? Uh, but in addition to this um, benefit to the child, uh, even though it was not um, sustained over 
the 30 days, uh, we also see benefit to, um, to the family members, right? So we had caregiver journaling, uh, so provide their uh, subjective uh, perception, self-report perception. Uh, they report that uh, their child uh, actually had more interaction outside of robotic uh, intervention uh, to be able to talk to um, the, their, their peers uh, in the playground. But this is more subjective, but we thought it's important because a lot of interactions actually happened outside of the uh, robotic interaction, right? So having parents to be able to document this is important. Uh, they also document that they actually feel less stress uh, with the robots um, being there for their kids. Some of the parents, they actually say the child was very excited. They just wanted to play with the robot uh, in the first, uh, the first thing in the morning. So we see a lot of potential of um, social robots um, just to bring more uh, positive to family, uh, family with special needs uh, kids. And obviously this is uh, still uh, fairly early. I think we just need to do more uh, how to personalize the interaction how to sustain, how to sustain the longer term uh, behavioral therapy in order to see sustained uh, benefits. And all that I think uh, will we'll just need more research in this space. So today I, I, I essentially rushed through these three different directions that we have been uh, thinking about and exploring uh, these days. Uh, we look at error awareness, we look at uh, group awareness, uh, both in the social domain, we are also thinking about a lot about um, social robots for uh, behavioral therapy. Now we are, um, after this um, autism research, right now we're looking at using social robots as a way for older adults, especially in the domain of sleep health. Uh, so I think um, we're still in the preliminary stage. So hopefully uh, in, the, in the couple of um, months, we have more uh, results to share. But I think uh, there's like a lot of opportunity for, for social robots to bring uh, health benefit and all just like bring the social socialness into uh, the interaction with people. So hopefully uh, with more, more work, uh, uh, we will see more and more uh, this kind of uh, assistive robots come into our environments, provide various kinds of assistance. Um, so with that, uh, thank you for uh, your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Ming Huang. Uh, it's great to uh, hear all your works. Thank you. And we're going to have a couple of questions. Audience. Yeah, you can unmute and uh, give your questions. Hopefully, that didn't go too fast. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, start a question here, actually. So uh, I think the, the teaching and learning is quite uh, uh, connected, related to each other. So do you have any uh, future uh, project or future research to combine your learning and teaching uh, research here? Yeah, that's actually a very good comment. Um, we have not, but I know there's a group uh, actually from Yale, uh, they look at this, right? So once you learn a skill, teaching is a way to apply those learned skills. Um, so I think they actually have an HI paper on this um, directly from human. So human provide demonstration to the robot, the robot learn a skill and the robot <laughs> leverage the learn skill uh, and then teach that to another naive user. So I think they are just, I think what you're saying is close the loop on learning to teaching, uh, just because that's the way most people would uh, learn the new things by teaching, right? So whenever we try to teach someone that just, you know, force you to relearn the, th the thing again. So I think you are right, you know, connecting the learning and teaching will be very interesting. Thank you, thank you. So any other uh, short questions? Uh, I have okay, a uh, oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, thank you for your uh, impressive talk. Um, uh, my question is about the last topic, uh, the uh, teaching social skill. Yep. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the research about the children with autism is also important uh, in terms of uh, the long-term survival survivability, uh, like you. 
uh, mentioned. And uh, I think another, there's another point of view, um, uh, rather than the uh, long-term survivability, uh, the transferring uh, ability. I mean, uh, how can we guarantee uh, when the children with the uh, autism uh, is able to uh, uh, learn uh, the social skill with robot, then how can we guarantee that they can uh, uh, they, they can do uh, have a joint attention or a social skill with real human? Yeah. So, no, I think that, that. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a wonderful question because that's also something we, we thought about. Um, so I um, so I'll I'll answer from two angle uh, two angles, but uh, I will say just generally this is open ended. Um, so the uh, the assessment I show you there about the that chart uh, assessment that was actually human human assessment. So I think you are right. We don't want them to be really good at interaction with the robots. We eventually want them to be able to translate that into human human interaction. So when we do assessment, we do uh, just clini clinically um, validated assessment. That's what people usually do uh, at clinics, right? So they will do human human assessment. So that improvement that, that I, I show you uh, was actually quote unquote human human um, improvement. Although I don't think that we can just claim that you transfer but at least that show you the potential of that. So that's one way uh, we did it is to traditional clinical assessment. The second, I think, is to the parent journaling I was referring to, just because a lot of interaction is outside um, the, um, the robot interaction. Actually, if we have time, I can play another video where a parent actually comment on this, that she saw, uh, her child actually interact with other people in the playground. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that kind of parent comments tell us something that we cannot track just because people, the, the kid is running out and then just do a lot of things outside of those 30 minutes interaction. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's something um, we are hoping to see more. Um, do we have time? If we have time, I can show that video very quickly. Oh yeah, yeah, probably just a short video, yeah. All right, let me just quickly share that. Um, so this is, um, uh, we, after the deployment, so this is day 30, essentially we went in to ready to take the robot out and we did this interview uh, with, 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 with the, the parent. So let's just watch this. Um, I felt as a, a mom having the ability to have this robot and to do a half an hour therapy with him that was really specific to what he needs to focus on was just, it seemed like a great opportunity for him and it, it's really been just, he's been engaged and intrigued and um, sometimes the th therapies are, they get a little exhausting and he's not excited and this one wasn't like that. He was, he was ready to play at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> that um, we went to the, to the playground one day and I noticed immediately he, there was a group of children playing um, in the sand and he walked up to them and said, hi, you know, what are you doing? And I don't think he would have done that a month ago. Um, so I think just the conversation, even though um, Jibo can't actually hear him, the engagement, the back and forth conversation that he's having um, and the constant practice every day, it seems to be helping um, the, the robot has eyes and just looking at the robot's eyes and paying attention to it, I've noticed that when he's talking to me, he'll, he'll look at me more, um, sometimes, but that those initial communication bids, they're becoming more prevalent more often, um, and the response, the immediate response, um, to something, um, and the inferring of feelings I've, I've noticed of, you know, what, what does your brother feel or what do I feel? And just kind of being able to read faces um, and put them to the appropriate emotion. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not like rocket science right now because we are only unable to quantify this, but just talking to the parents that give us a little bit of hope that this uh -huh. would quote unquote transfer. Um, but yeah, I don't, we don't, I don't think we have like, you know, like solid evidence to, to claim that yet. Okay, thank you for your kind explanation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you for your wonderful uh, presentation. Okay, thank you.
So this is the time limit. We're gonna move to the next uh, uh, invited talk. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Min Su Chang, could you read the third? Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation. And the next invited speaker is Dr. Do Hyung Kim. Um, Dr. Do Hyung Kim, you can share your presentation. Okay. Um, let me introduce him briefly. He is a principal researcher at Human Robot Interaction Research Team um, in Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute. He is an expert in vision based motion tracking analysis and action recognition and detection, and also domain adaptation. Um, today, he will uh, talk about daily activity recognition of the elderly for human care robots. Please welcome Dr. Do Hyung Kim. Thank you, Dr. Jiang. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, yes, we can okay. see your slide. Okay, uh, thank you for giving me a good opportunity to introduce our studies. My talk is about AI for human care robots. Especially, I'd like to explain our efforts for daily activity recognition of the elderly. First, let me tell you about our overall works on AI for robots. We have been studying on robot intelligence to prepare for the age of coexistence of humans and robots. In particular, we are focusing on the intelligence for human care robots that can socially interact with human beings. The target consumers consider are the elderly people who can maintain independent living, but are generally weak and incompetent in some capabilities. Let me briefly tell you about the main software components we have. Uh, first of all, we need to understand the humans. Facial attributes recognition is a neural network model that can recognize face ID, expression, gender, hairstyle, and others. Human tracking is one of the most fundamental components for HRI. Uh, we have also developed an outfit recognition model for the elderly. The robots may recommend the suitable clothes for today's weather to the elderly or have a small talk with them about their clothing style. The following three components are related to human actions daily action recognition that can when and what the elderly do some activities in their daily lives. Activities, uh, activities like eating, dressing, cleaning, and so on. Uh, pose estimation extract, extract the joint position from 2D IGB images. It can be used as a fundamental component for human motion analysis. Uh, as a human motion assessment, they can provide exercise coaching services to the elderly. I will explain the three software components related to human motion in detail later. Uh, we are also studying object detection, uh, object detection and recognition. A robot can detect an object while moving and recognize whose object it is, and then pick up and carry the object for example, if an old lady forgot where she put her cell phone, a robot could find it and bring it to her using this software module. The bottom three technologies are related to the robot motion generation. Motion generation is very important for natural human robot interaction. Uh, with our motion generation methods, robots can create their own motions suitable for the uh, situation. Uh, we are doing now three motion generation studies. Among them, my coworker, Dr. Go, will present her research on nonverbal interaction behavior generation in the teacher session this workshop. Uh, we are putting a lot of effort into verifying performance in real world environments uh, we made some prototype robot services with our technologies and currently provide the services to the elderly uh, at their home and the public welfare centers. 
We develop robot software intelligence, not robot hardware. So we usually test our software with commercial robots like a Pepper Now and others. My coworker, Dr. Joe, will also talk about our efforts in the teaser session. Uh, we are opening our main software components and data sets to the public. So far, a total of 13 components and nine data sets have been released. Uh, please visit our website and see if there are any useful things. Uh, I explain the overall studies related to human care robot intelligence. From now on, I will talk about action recognition much more. Uh, we have been studying the action recognition of the elderly, which is to recognize what activities they do in their daily lives. Actually, it's correct to say an action detection because it detects the time point along with the action ID. But I think in this presentation, it would be better to use a more familiar term, action recognition. Uh, why do we have to recognize daily activities of the elderly? Uh, basically, we can provide some useful services through the result of the daily activity recognition. For simple example, recognition of fall down action can be directly linked to the emergency call services. If robots can recognize taking medicine action, robots can actually check whether the elderly take medicine or not. Therefore, active medication management is possible. This is so different from AI speakers just telling you when you should take medicine. More importantly, it, uh, if daily activities can be observed for a long time, robots will be able to model the lifestyle of the elderly. Uh, for example, when the elderly repeatedly show abnormal behavior patterns, it may be possible to detect health problems in the early stages. With this lifestyle information, robots can understand behaviors of the elderly more deeply. Uh, you know, in deep learning based robot vision research, sufficient large scale data sets are essential. In the field of action recognition, there are many benchmark data sets, but it's difficult to find action data sets for robots. In particular, there are no data sets for the elderly. So we built new action data sets for elderly care robots in real world and virtual environment. Depending on the application domain, the problem you want to solve may differ. In the CCTV security domain, uh, one of the biggest issue is copying with poor images due to changes of weather conditions. Also, how to track small people well is an, another important issue. On the other hand, in the case of robots, few changes and illumination changes are a difficult problem because robots are moving. Also, body parts may be covered by some object in the house, like tables or chairs. Even the entire body may not be seen in the video. Uh, various data uh, are needed to cope with all these changes, and the virtual data set can be uh, effectively utilized. Uh, what daily activities of the elderly should we recognize? A close understanding of what the elderly actually do in their daily life is essential for constructing a useful data set. We visited the homes of 53 elderly people over the age of 70 years and monitored and documented their daily behavior from morning to night. Then we selected most frequent actions. There are 55 action classes of which 52 are derived from the observation of daily activities of the elderly, like eating, cleaning, reading, and so on. The rest three actions are human-robot interaction-specific actions, like waving, beckoning, and pointing. Among them, there are five mutual actions, such as handshaking and hugging. Uh, we rented an apartment and used it as a testbed for real-world research. In this testbed, we built a new data set 
for recognizing the daily activities of the elderly and list the data set named elderly activity 3D. Uh, we recruited 50 elderly people aged between 64 and 88 years, uh, which led to a realistic intra-class variation of the actions. Uh, we also recruited 50 young people in their 20s. This composition allows us uh, to perform various comparative experiments between the behavior of the elderly and that of the young. Uh, thus, we were provided uh, with a deeper understanding of the behavior characteristics of the elderly. Uh, the activity, uh, the activity, activity 3D data set is collected using Kinect V2 sensors, and it consists of three synchronized data modalities, RGB video, depth map, and skeleton sequences. This table shows a representative 3D action recognition data set. The most commonly used data set is NTU RGB plus D data set. NTU data set is an excellent benchmark data set. We also use it. However, it consists of on, uh, only adult actions captured in a laboratory, not at home. So it's not so suitable for human care robots. Our data set is the first large scale data set that consider the elderly, robots, and the home environment in which they interact. So far, more than 100 research institutes around the world are using our data set for their studies. We also visited the 50 households where the elderly actually live and built a real world data set essential for practical research. It was released under the name of Atri Activity 3D Living Lab. Uh, this is the first 3D action recognition data set taken from the robot field of view in the Eldridge real house. Then for the video clips of Living Lab data set, uh, as you can see, it reflects the natural movements of the elderly at home. If the reliability of your action recognizer has been verified on the living lab data set, it can be said that the model is likely to operate stably in real life as well. Uh, in addition, I wanna say this. The process of building and releasing good data set is very difficult and exhausting task. Planning, design, collecting, refining, verification, uh, releasing to the public, all processes are important and take a lot of time and money. Uh, first of all, in order for the collected data to be meaningful, planning and design must be done well. It is necessary to analyze what data researchers currently need the most and what characteristics the data should have to help them with their actual research. Uh, refining and verification are also very important processes directly related to the quality of the data set. And no matter how well the data is collected, if refining and verification is not so good, the data becomes useless. In fact, it is the most time consuming and difficult step. And in, in addition, it was difficult to secure data safely in the COVID-19 situation because it was targeted at the elderly people. Uh, it is also necessary to obtain agreement from the elderly to use personal information. Uh, we have been developing an action recognition model for elderly care robots using the data set we created. There is a difference in uh, movement between the elderly and the general adult. For example, adult movement is faster and the radius uh, movement is greater than that of the elderly. In our studies, when learning with elderly data, the elderly showed higher performance rate than adults. This result, uh, on, uh, on the contrary, when learning with adult data, adults showed higher performance than the elderly. Uh, this result implied that there is a difference between the behavior of the elderly and adults. 
we need to design the action recognition model with the characteristic of the elderly to get a better model. In this respect, it is meaningful to build the uh, elderly data set for our own studies. Well, the accuracy of our action recognition model is about 95% on the elderly activity 3D data set. On the other hand, it showed about 70% accuracy in the living lab data set. The reason for the difference in performance is because of the domain gap. Uh, to solve this problem, we are now doing seem to real research like domain adaptation. Uh, actually, action recognition is a difficult problem to solve. Temporal information should be considered because we should deal with the video data, not images. Uh, like other computer vision technologies, its performance is rapidly increasing with deep learning methods. We expect that action recognition technology can be actively uh, used in the field sooner or later. As you know, in the deep learning studies, the more diverse data, the better recognition performance. However, it is not easy to capture large scale data set reflecting various lighting conditions, various robust field of view, various background in a real world environment. Moreover, data acquisition of elders ADL is challenging due to the privacy and physical limitations of the elderly. So we are trying to solve these problems using virtual synthetic data. Our joint research institute KISS team developed a synthetic action simulation platform that can generate the synthetic data on elders' daily activities. For 55 kinds of frequent daily activities, Elder Sim generates realistic motion of synthetic characters and provides some output modalities. Uh, we also provide the KIST SYN ADA dataset, which is generated from the simulation platform. Uh, you can also download the dataset and platform from our, from our website. Uh, this video shows our virtual data generation platform. Motion capture and graphics technology were used to simulate the home environment and activities of the elderly. We chose the Unreal Engine 4 as our main rendering engine for real-time photorealistic, photorealistic rendering. Uh, you can generate a large amount of activity data by variously changing conditions like a human and robot locations, key points, lighting conditions, and background. We hope that our virtual data generation platform can help solve the data shortage problem. Uh, we are investigating various methods to enhance action recognition performance using the virtual data set. Uh, this table shows how much performance has improved when using our virtual data set. When synthetic data are augmented in training, we observe a firm performance increase for all the considered action recognition methods. KISS team have conducted various investigations to verify the usefulness of virtual data set as well. Please refer to the paper below for more information. Uh, this is a virtual environment that simulates the, uh, the residential space of the elderly. In the virtual space, you can get image sequences while moving the robot. This, make, uh, this makes it so easy to test our software components in various scenarios. Uh, this scene shows that our object detection engine is locating some objects randomly placed in the virtual space. Uh, we are now improving the platform so that we can recognize the activity of the elderly living in the virtual space. In order to secure stable action recognition performance in real world, uh, it may be practical to recognize activities in, in multimodal based methods that additionally utilize various information as well as human motion information. More robust performance can be achieved by utilizing additional information such as interacting object, location, and posture information of the elderly. Uh, 
Uh, I explained our efforts for action recognition of the elderly. From now on, I briefly introduce our motion assessment technology. The motion assessment system compares the user's movements with the performance of a professional trainer to provide a systematic coaching service to the user. Uh, in general, when you learn some motions like fitness or K-pop dance, you usually search and watch fitness trainers or K-pop dancers on YouTube and just copy their moves. In this way, there is no feedback on your moves. You don't know how well you perform now and how much your motion has improved. Uh, with our technology, we can provide an analytical evaluation on the learner's motion. Uh, for example, we provided a fitness coaching service to the, uh, to the elderly with a robot pepper, and old people love this coaching service so much. There are two important key technologies. The first one is pose estimation. Our motion assessment is based on the skeleton comparison between two motions. So the better the pose estimator, the better the overall assessment performance. Uh, the other one is motion analysis model. Uh, no matter how good the skeleton tracker is, there must be errors. So despite the errors, we need to compare two motions accurately. For one simple example, we may give lower weight values to the joints with low confidence. Uh, this is the result of the pose estimation in video clips downloaded from YouTube. Uh, it's stably estimating human poses in various movements. Uh, when it comes to practical use, our pose estimator can be compared to the most widely known open pose. Uh, ours has an advantage in performance and speed of open pose. We also have been developing a lightweight version that works on cell phones. Uh, you, can download, uh, you can download our pose estimator from the Google App Store. Uh, it runs stably on the Samsung Galaxy S9 or higher. Uh, you can see the demonstration video clip here. Uh, left top is a standard motion of the home trainer and the learner on the right top is following the trainer's motion. Uh, to, ev to evaluate the learner's motion, we basically compare the skeleton similarity between two motions, and then we provide some useful feedback on the learner's motion. Uh, first, we can count the number of repetitions of motion the user did. The height of a blue bar shows the motion accuracy score, and the red line means motion speed. At the bottom, graphs are showing pose assessment results. You know, a, pose, a, a motion is made from a sequence of postures. Uh, you can see several colored graphs, which represent posture accuracy for each arm and leg. Uh, we've transferred our motion assessment technology to quite a few companies. Okay, uh, the end of my talk. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And any questions from the audience? You can unmute your mic and you can ask a question. Um, sorry, I have a quick question. Great. Um, uh, Dr. Kim, I want to make sure, like, uh, can we directly access to all the data sets or we need to kind of like apply um, some procedure, you know, maybe contact you or others. Uh, you mean a database? Yeah, 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 database, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. our technology and data sets are free to use for academic purpose only, okay? It oh, is already okay, used okay. by many institutions. For commercial use, a separate consultation is required with us. Okay, great, great, thank you. Uh, Sorry, I have one more question. So yes. I remember as a very beginning, you mentioned like uh, some nonverbal interaction behavior generation for the robot pepper. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, do you have any publication or GitHub 
um, because I'm really curious about this work. I really want to take a more look about yeah, this. Yeah, work. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, in order for robots to perform certain movements, programmers had to code them one by one. So there were high cost and limitations in scalability. Uh, to overcome these limitations, we have developed technology that allow robots to create their own uh, contextual movement. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'd like to give you a detailed description of technique, but I am not an actual developer. I think uh, you can uh, report to the paper, our paper on our website. So I guess once I search your name, maybe I can got that, um, got that paper. Uh, you can uh, search keyword cost pitch gesture recognition. Uh, cost pitch gesture generation. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And yep, we are going to move on to the next invited talk. Professor Ahn. So now we have the final invited talk today from uh, Professor Guy Hoffman. Uh, Guy Hoffman got his PhD from MIT in the field of HRI and uh, worked as a research fellow at Georgia Tech and MIT. And at uh, 2017, he joined to the Cornell University as an assistant professor. He is a head of the uh, Human Robot Collaboration and Companionship Group and studying on algorithms, interaction schema, and design enabling the uh, interactions between human and robot. And actually to, uh, today, uh, Guy Hoffman couldn't join us. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, we're gonna, we're gonna show you uh, the pre-recorded video from Guy Hoffman. Uh, talk is about the human robot interaction challenges in the workplace. Yeah, so, Professor Min, uh, Min Chang, could you pl please play the video? Hi, uh, my name is Guy Hoffman. I'm from Cornell University. Um, and my research lab is called the Human Robot Collaboration Companionship Lab. You can see the URL here if you want to learn more about uh, the work we do in our lab at hrc2.io. Uh, today, I want to talk about robots in the workplace and HRI uh, for robotics um, who work with people. And this is in part motivated by probably the number one question I get when I give uh, um, lectures to the um, general public. Uh, the number one question I think most roboticists get is, will robots take my job? It could be a different, a different version. Will there be no jobs left when robotics gets better? Uh, what will people do when robots and I uh, will take over or will do everything that we do? And it's a question um, that is really much more complicated than a simple yes or no, uh, or you know, we will all be unemployed or we will all just continue to live uh, normally. I want to dig into this a little bit and also talk about the HRI challenges that come with these questions of robots entering the workplace. It's definitely uh, something that's um, on uh, many people's minds. Um, this is uh, a recent, uh, a few years ago at the, the World Economic Forum, which was uh, had many sessions dedicated exactly to this question um, of will robots, uh, you know, how will they impact the economy? Um, and after th uh, thinking about you know, robots and human robot interaction uh, uh, for many years now, uh, I've come to the conclusion that we should stop thinking about the typical way that we think about robotics and uh, labor and robotics in the workplace is, is a purely technological question, meaning you know, what will robots be able to do? Or an economic question, uh, what would be economically efficient for robots to do? Uh, what would be the economic outcomes? But it must be a question of values and how we're gonna structure our society. Um, and this should be the, the sort of leading type of discussion uh, that I think uh, we should be talking about when we talk about robots and the workplace. When I talk about robots in the workplace, I uh, distinguish it from two other domains that uh, we often think about. Uh, and in a recent uh, survey article that, is, uh, that will be published, um, I think later this year, uh, I, uh, my co-authors and I, my students in the lab and I, have been sort of looking at HRI research across three main domains, homes, 
public spaces and, and, and workplaces. In a way, considering how how uh, popular the question is, will robots take my job? And but like people, how much people are worried about this this question of, of robotics uh, in the workplace and how it relates to the workplace. I think surprisingly, in our survey, we found that most HRI research or most research about how uh, robots and humans interact or how robots affect people has been focused more in the in in homes and public spaces. And while, while they're not completely separate, because some people work at home and uh, some people work in other people's homes and some public places like uh, like uh, shopping malls and airports are also workplaces for other people. Um, I think mostly these interaction questions that have been posed in the human robot interaction research have been around uh, end user and robot interaction. So digging in a little bit more about like what robotics and work uh, looks like, I mean, there are people today who work with robotics, uh, the sort of three Three of the leading uh, areas would be so space exploration, uh, surgery, uh, robot assisted surgery, and the military. Um, what is common to these, uh, to these workplaces is that they interact with highly trained professionals. And so they can be thought of as, as these like, highly sophisticated tools. And while there, is, there are some interaction uh, questions there, usually the people who work with them are not people who have, have just you know come across this job or are, are on, on a, this is really people's career. And I think in a lot of cases that uh, people, um, um, while there might be some issues with the robots entering these spaces, they supplement uh, these people's uh, highly uh, proficient technical skills. And, and, and these are not the, the kind of questions people are mostly worried about when they, when they think about robots in, in the workplace. Um, other than that, with these highly trained professionals, we don't see a lot of robots in the workplace. People do have this imagination uh, that robots are um, increasingly uh, entering manufacturing. I think a lot of people have this idea that uh, cars are manufactured by robots, um, or that that they uh, there's these robotics, you know, Kiva robots or Amazon robotics uh, that work in, in warehouses. Uh, but really, when you go, um, I was I was. Uh, recently at a Ford factory that uh, makes the F-150 truck. And you will see that almost all the activities are being done by humans, the ro robots, and, uh, you know, they do painting and welding and some quality assurance, but, but you know, every seat belt that you, that you close has been put there with the human hand. And similarly, even in the Amazon warehouses, um, the robots may move shelves around, but they do not pack anything into the boxes, which is the main the main work there. So in, the, in these places where we imagine robotics to be very prevalent, actually human work is very, very uh, central. And uh, one of the biggest problems really is grasping. Um, and you know, we can, you can see here the Amazon grasping challenge. And I think for places like Amazon or, or, or uh, um, manufacturing companies are really trying to solve this grasping problem, but we are definitely in, an, in, a, in a stage where grasping is an emerging technology and not a soft technology. And so their uh, robots will be still around. Another thing to, to think about is that when we think about manufacturing, for example, or, or assembly, uh, this is not the growing, this is not the, the sort of largest part or even the most growing part in, in, in the US economy and in many um, sort of industrial nations economy where really, most people work in service jobs, you know, but be it you know at, at a shop or in a, in a, in a, in a uh, retail center, or it could be at a hospital or some other you know, medical service um, uh, environment. And there we've started to to introduce uh, uh, robotics. You know, there's companies like Diligent Robotics that put uh, you know robots in uh, to help nurses, or we have the Badger robot that uh, scans uh, shelves. And we immediately see that once um, we're talking about these very unstructured and not as you know professionally trained environments uh, there are a lot of psychological challenges that come up with it for example uh, the badger robot the way that it was programmed to keep a certain distance for safety ended up creating as, as some sort of a behavior that many people that, that some people uh, qualified it as as stalking so the robot would wait a few uh, like a meter away from the person to keep the safety distance as soon as the person moved to the next shelf the robot would come you know this distance closer and seemed like the robot was sort of like stalking the person. Now, on research, we've tried to think even beyond these types of service jobs. And um, here's a, an illustration from Wired magazine that talks about AI or robotic therapy. And we actually found in our, in our own research 
that robots can uh, give people a sense of being listened to, even though the robots are not actually understanding anything that's being said. And in the, in the study uh, with uh, Professor Birnbaum from, uh, from a few years ago, uh, we showed that people had higher self-confidence and, and after talking to a robot about that traumatic experience. So we can even think about robots entering service uh, jobs like uh, psychologists or interviewing victims. And, and you can see it, a tweet from a few years ago um, that people are thinking about robotic lawyers that can interview refugees and ask them questions. And there's actually good, good reasons to do this. And again, when we think about this question of the psychological impact of these types of job interactions, many times um, a victim um, of violence of, or, or, or a, a victim of political unrest can feel more confident to talk to a machine um, about some experience than uh, because they might feel that they're, that they're being less judged by that machine, as, as for example, also uh, Sherry Turkler has uh, talked about. So I would say, in summary, for this part is, is that that we there are many people working on, on introducing robots to a lot more workplaces and and i think especially the service industry uh, which has not seen as, as many robotics um, applications will probably see more of them over the next few years but in all of these usually uh, researchers uh, reassure us and i have said the same many times that you know robots are not going to replace workers they're going to be working together with workers um, and therefore, it'll just you know it's just be a change of the way that you work. The worker might be more efficient. Um, and every funding proposal talks about human robot collaboration rather than a robotic replacement. Uh, but is that really so? I think it's it's actually also a little bit more complicated. You know, uh, Darren Asimoglu from MIT um, has done several uh, research uh, studies that looked at. Uh, evidence from the U.S. job market, a famous uh, paper of his from, uh, I think it was the 2015 or 17, uh, I don't have the citation here right now, is that for every robot introduced per thousand workers, um, un unemployment went up by uh, by uh, 0.2 percentage points. So, you know, you, you, you put, uh, you know, you put five robots um, uh, 2,000 workers, and, and you have another percentage of an, uh, unemployment in that county, and wages um, went down by about half a percent. So this is not insignificant. Um, a more recent study from, from uh, last year, about, about a year ago, shows that uh, introducing robotics into the, into the American um, labor market actually causes uh, unemployment in, in other countries that supply uh, materials and goods to the United States. So you might make the, the American worker more uh, efficient in this case, but the, as a result, you might may, might cause economic harm to another country. So this again sort of highlights to us that we should really think about the, the, the long-term consequence of, of, uh, of different types of jobs that, that robots can, uh, can do. Um, so let's say we even could imagine a situation where robots and humans uh, work together even then, we have to think specifically about the details, not just about, you know, somebody going to work or not going to work. Are they, you know, getting paid or not getting paid? Do they have a salary or work or not? Um, we're definitely going to see more and more technology, like as you've probably seen, and this, this has been even more prominent uh, during the pandemic, um, that uh, uh, automation is uh, introduced in places to replace workers. But even when you don't replace workers, um, I think it's interesting to think about how do you exactly set up the relationship between the worker and the robot in the workplace? This is a study, um, a monitor incentive competition between humans and robots that was done with uh, uh, um, Professor Ori Heffetz and, and uh, some of our graduate students. We show that if people work together with the robot, but they get paid based on uh, their performance relative to the robot, this causes people not just to, to like the robot less, as you can see on the left graph, which is how much the robot is liked uh, depending on how good the robot is, but it also causes people to feel less self, less competent about how well they are they are doing the job. So even though they might not have been affected directly by the robot um, financially, uh, although in this case it's a little bit more complicated, and I encourage you to read the paper, um, they they still would have gotten the same amount of money on average for each task they did. But just because the robot was was better than them, caused them to feel uh, less confident about how well they do the task. So what I what I sort of take from this is that um, you want to 
not only think about whether you want to introduce robots to the workplace, but also how do you set up the relationship of you know, compensation, of the competition, of collaboration between the human and the robot. And this study was, was uh, really uh, uh, one way that illuminated this, this difficulty. Another question that people often think about is this question of automatability of jobs. So which jobs you know, can be automated? And you know, Leila Takayama and Wendy Chu have done some really interesting studies um, around 2010 uh, that, that said what people thought you know, uh, robots should do or what, and what experts thought robots should do. And one of the interesting points here is that it, it's not the same. Uh, if you ask the general public, uh, people did not think robots are, are, um, are appropriate for jobs that uh, have any sort of uh, judgment, evaluation, or creativity. Whereas if uh, you ask the robotics experts, they actually think that uh, you know, robots should be working in places where they manage and direct people and where they uh, think creatively. Um, I really like this, this model by, uh, by Otto, Levi, and Myrna and the ALM model. Um, which sort of says, you know, we have to think about, about automation in, in these two um, on these two directions, how cognitive versus how physical the work is, how routine and how routine versus how dynamic the work is. Um, and they say the more cognitive and the more dynamic the work, uh, the less appropriate it would be for, for robotics. But I want to close by talking a little bit about a research project that we've been working on that, that challenges this point of view a little bit. And, and we're actually interested in, in exactly these jobs that are considered uh, very creative um, and very dynamic. And we're specifically looking at the problem of robotics helping designers uh, do design work or decision makers um, make decisions. Uh, and this is uh, inspired by the idea that you know, we actually think that robots can can do a lot to help people uh, make decisions because people and robots have very complementary skills here. And this is maybe an area where we can live up to the promise of robots not replacing, but, uh, um, but helping humans. And the reason is that robots are not very good at these big, live, big picture, high level thinking, intuition, generalizing from examples, even though people are working on this, this is not something that they're good at. And so if we can look at this, at this problem for a while, um, and, and we had some pretty interesting results. So here, this is a graph that might be a little bit out of context, but I just want to uh, show um, the, uh, geometrically like what we're seeing here. So here we're seeing a human and a robot trying to solve uh, this optimization problem uh, where you where, you know, lower on the graph is better, it's cheaper, and more to the right is also better because it means that there's, there's more science benefit. And this is a scientific design problem. And you can see that if the AI is trying to solve this problem, it's very broad, but also um, uh, compared to the human. So if the human is exploring the problem, they have a very narrow sort of trade-off. You know, They can get more performance being going further to the right, but it also get, gets more expensive. But when we had humans and robots collaborate on this uh, scientific design problem, we actually got results that were uh, more optimal than either of these two could have done uh, by themselves. Um, we then also uh, repeated this for a different type of problem, which is a political decision-making problem. And here you can see uh, a human working with a robot and trying to figure out how to design voting districts. So this is uh, to, to counter this problem of gerrymandering that the people in the US might have uh, heard of, which is uh, related to structuring voting districts in a way that's beneficial to one party, but not the other. Um, and again, we have, uh, we have found that, that you know, they can collaborate uh, together. But one of the problems that we found in our previous design problem is that, that the robot was not very good at understanding what the human is trying to do, or what, the, what their intention was. And in, in this case, we showed that we can have the robot track only the structure of the solution, fi of, of the, of the solution finding process of the human. So the robot would look at like, how does the, the person redraw the map and how does the person redraw the, the boundaries between the map? And the robot was able to correctly uh, or better than chance uh, uh, with about, uh, depending on the conditions, around 70% accuracy, detect what is the thing that the person is actually trying to achieve by doing what they are doing. And so from this, from this research, which I've just really touched on, um, we, had, we have three, um, we have three uh, insights. The first is that human and I teams can, can find better designs when they work together. Um, the other study, which I haven't talked, talked about in this case, is that uh, people might have goals that are, that are hard for the, for the robot to, to understand, uh, but we did make some progress recently 
uh, in which uh, the robot can uh, can sort of help uh, help people und uh, can, can understand people's goals and therefore help them in a more uh, reliant way. So if I want to summarize, um, I think we should really think about uh, robots taking our jobs. And here again, I'm going back to this like public spaces, home and work. Um, uh, Sub, uh, distinction. And I think we should think about uh, robots taking our jobs in terms of the kinds of values we want to promote. The first way to think about this is think about our competitive advantage. Robots will get better and they will be able to enter more of the jobs, but at any job, you should think about what are humans actually good at and what do we want to preserve from that. Um, the second is we have to think about the larger ecosystems. You know, the way that we introduce robots. Uh, might affect places not just in our workspace but across society and maybe even in other societies in other countries uh, so we have to be careful about the way that we structure incentives um, and the way that we are um, the, the way that we are structuring the collaboration of the competition between robots in the workplace and in the end i think there's one one place where i think robots will really not be able to take our jobs and this is um the, exactly the point I'm talking about, which is what are our values, what do we want to promote, and decision making at the highest level. And 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 um, because in a sense, robots will always be able, uh, will always have to optimize for some sort of um, value or some sort of um, goal that we have as a society. And so, in a sense, the sort of political, societal, ethical deliberation process is something that we will always have to do ourselves, and therefore uh, we will. Um, uh, th therefore, it is not uh, in a, a danger to be taken by uh, by robotics. So, thank you uh, for um, uh, your attention. And I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person or live. Um, but hopefully, this uh, this was some uh, um, uh, food for thought to think about HOI challenges for robots in the workplace. Thank you very much. Okay, so if you have any question, please uh, email to Guy Hoffman directly. Okay, thank you. And now we're gonna move to the next session, which is the teacher session. So uh, first we have six papers in this session and uh, Dr. Min Su Jang will uh, be in char uh, chairing of the first three papers. And then I will take the next uh, half of the session here. So Dr. Min Su Jang. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we have six papers. And the first paper is by um, Mikhail Stollars. The title of the paper is Personalized Behavior Model for Autism Therapy. Um, Mikhail Flor. I'm sorry, Mikhail Stolarts, you can share your presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the possibility to present today our topic. And uh, yeah, today, tomorrow with my coworkers, uh, co-authors, I would like to present the topic, which is personalized behavior model for autism therapy. And this work is conducted in the context of the Migrave project funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research. Um, so first of all, I would like to mention the motivation behind this work, uh, which is that um, quite many, so around one in 160 children or all, all over the world is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, so in this disorder, the symptoms uh, are usually that uh, the children have problems with uh, social communication with other people. And for example, children have difficulties in recognizing emotions of other people. Uh, to alleviate the symptoms of this disorder, uh, there are conducted therapies. And there are also conducted therapies with robots. As children with autism find robots easier to communicate with uh, than with people. And when uh, the robots are introduced, the therapists uh, usually have to control the robot remotely. And unfortunately, it means that uh, its workload is increased. 
So it is an approach to decrease, uh, to increase the autonomy of the robot in order to reduce this workload. And here comes our aim of this work. Um, so in this project entirely, we would like to develop the robot that should help the therapist in improving the child's performance in the therapy game. And it should also prevent the child from getting bored, uh, demotivated, not engaged. So it should re-engage the child in a proper situation. Moreover, the robot should adapt its behavior uh, based on the feedback from the therapist to each indiv individual child. Uh, and the goal of this work is to develop a behavior model algorithm that will enable decision-making process in such a robot and will enable uh, learning during the entire therapy. And our approach for this problem is reinforcement learning. So as we can see on figure two, the robot perceives the state of the child. And the state is defined with three variables. The, states, the child's engagement, motiva motivation, which relates to the speed of the movements of the child during the game, and game performance, which is uh, considered as the number of movements for correct and not correct movements of the child during the game, and also the time from the, from the last movement of the child. When the robot receives such a child state, then it selects a proper action based on the policy that is being learned. And such an action can be, for example, encouragement, in a form of motivating feedback or even waving uh, for to in, uh, in increase the engagement of the child or also proposition so the robot proposes the child to continue playing the game in case it's not really focused on it and uh, the robot suggests the action to the therapist then the therapist can decide if this can reject this action or can uh, approve this action. In case if he rejects this action, he suggests a more proper one. And this information is sent back to the robot as a feedback. Then the robot is learning based on this feedback and sends and performs a proper action. So to evaluate uh, our solution, we would like to use the rule-based child model introduced by Emmanuel Senft. Um, and then we would like to use this model on the QT robot, which will be used as a tutor in a tablet-based therapeutic game, as we can see on figure three. Um, that's for, for our teaser. Thank you very much. And yes, please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions from the audience? Um, I would like to ask one question. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Um, to apply reinforcement learning, you need a lot of data usually. How many interactions um, were needed to properly train your reinforcement learning model? Uh, okay, so uh, for now, it depends, of course, on the parameters, on the discretization of the state space uh, that we introduced in our extended abstract, and it all depends on the parameters that might be used. So right now, we are in the phase of experimentation. Thus, I cannot tell the most efficient uh, the most efficient parameters and data that is required to train it. Okay, uh, I see. Yeah. I'm curious to see your final results with this study. Okay, thank you for your presentation and we will go on to the next paper. The next paper is by Norina Gestiger.
at the University of, of Auckland. The title of the paper is Developing Assistive Health Robots for Older Adults, an in international four-year project and participatory design case study. So please share your presentation. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can hear me okay and you can see my screen. So my name is Marina Gus Tiger and today I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors. As you've just said, it, it's um, on developing assistive health robots for older adults and it's an international four-year project and participatory design case study. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge our funder the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy. And I'd also like to acknowledge all of the collaborators who are part of making this fantastic project happen. So we know that declining health due to aging can pose serious challenges for independence for older adults. Um, but previous research has shown that brain training and social engagement can help to support cognitive functioning, while reminders, reminders for daily tasks like taking medicines can support independence and aging in place. Assistive technologies like cognitive stimulation games and robots like the pictured Kia Obot can also help to promote autonomy. However, while promising, older adults are often excluded in technology design due to underrepresentation or due to the use of proxies instead like carers and caregivers. And this can create serious issues with acceptability when implementing robots with older adults. The participatory design process is an alternative design process that includes future users as experts, and it can help to avoid deficit framing like ableism and ageism, and also promotes empowerment through participation. It's also contextually dependent by acknowledging that people best experience products and technologies when using them in their personal and preferred spaces. And it's really crucial for ensuring that older adults can and want to continue to use technology, including robotics. So the aim of our project overall was to design, develop and evaluate a daily care robot and cognitive stimulation games for use within older adults' homes. And our end users were expected to be older adults with and without mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia and various age-related health needs. So across four years, we conducted six main components. And the first was to define the requirements for a daily care robot through interviews with 33 participants. Um, experts were then involved in developing some cartoon strips for how scenarios might play out and how a daily care robot might help an older adult in their daily life. The scenarios were then designed and implemented on the Stillbot and we developed some videos of them with uh, the Silverbot interacting with a human actor and 18 people then watched the scenario videos and gave their feedback. In the third stage, 10 experts actually interacted with Silbot and gave their feedback on what they thought about the scenarios and whether the robot was easy to use and appropriate. In the fourth component, uh, we tested the acceptability and feasibility of some cognitive stimulation games using this Bomi One Games robot. And there were, across five weeks of use, we had 10 older adults use the robot games and then um, complete some questionnaires on their use. And experts were also involved in making some observations on the gameplay. And the fifth component, we tested the feasibility of the daily care robot with the games and um, this was tested on the BOMI robot which was developed specifically for this project by RoboCare. And we had six older adults use the robot in their own homes unsupervised and unrestricted for one week and then give us their feedback and then lastly we tested the usability and effectiveness of the games in a randomized controlled trial with the analysis um, still ongoing. So I can give you some feedback on how we used a participatory design process, and we're hoping to publish a paper soon that synthesizes our overall approach. So in general, the future users determine the requirements, and this contests a traditional design process where developers might have to imagine the health needs of future users or simply search for a problem for a technology to solve. Context was really important and all of our work was conducted in homes or preferred spaces of future users. And our approach avoided deficit framing because the daily care robot was understood and also designed to support independence without compromising autonomy. 
And overall, by centralizing the opinions of 119 stakeholders, we help to design a user-friendly robot for supporting well-being through daily reminders, such as um, waking up, bedtimes, um, taking medicines and playing the cognitive games and attending appointments, and also in delivering cognitive stimulation games. So I'm happy to take any questions. And while you're here, I'd like to invite you to participate in some research that we're currently doing on making robots more empathetic. So if you'd like to participate, you can scan the QR code on the screen using your mobile device and it will take you directly to our 15 minute online survey. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, everybody can take the survey. Oh, and you, you can oh. display your QR code. <laughs> I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anybody have has any questions? Um, can I ask a short question? Um, in your participatory design, uh, you know, 119 stakeholders were participated. Mm -hmm. What kind of opinions did they um, give for your study? Yeah, so right from the start, um, we had, so we had older adults who were healthy or had mild cognitive impairments or mild dementia. And we also had experts um, and carers and relatives as well participate. So everybody gave different feedback based on what they thought the daily care robot should do. The experts in general gave more feedback on sort of therapeutic benefits of a daily care robot. So being able to deliver social engagement activities or de deliver the cognitive stimulation games. Whereas the older adults sort of gave more feedback on the usability and the ease of use um, based on actual interactions with the robot. Okay, thank you. And yeah, I connected. Um, That's great. No, no, Thank it you. does not show, but I connected <laughs> to your site with your QR code. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And um, okay, Professor An, the next paper. Uh, please go on with the next paper. Uh, there should be Keith Hyunuk Bin. Yep. Right. In paper. Okay. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Hyunuk Bin from uh, KIST. He's going to present about the paper, a uh, robot framework design for human robot interaction with test state model in real environments. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Yep. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Hyunuk Bin uh, at uh, Korea Institute of Sci Science and Technology. My presentation is a robot framework design for human robot interaction with tech state model in real environment. So let's start the presentation. Uh, let me show you a simple scenario between human and robot. Uh, robot say, hello, hello, Brian. And person say, hello, robot. Robot say, what can I do for you, sir? Person say, where is the restroom? Robot say, I will show you where the restroom is. Uh, person say, thank you. It is a very simple scenario. However, implementing this simple scenario is not simple. ID recognition is required to recognize the name. Task plan is needed to think what the robot will do. To understand human speech, robot need to uh, need a, uh, dialogue managing, intent estimation, and keyword extraction. Robot needs gesture generation and navigation to guide people. Robot needs so many skills to even talk to human. As a simple example just before, uh, the robot system is a combination of many sensors, actuators, uh, and computing modules. Uh, there are many open source mm, computing modules. There are many open sources that can help you use uh, each element element effectively. However, in order to interact in the real environment, uh, complex and standardized system at the 
upper level is required. In this research, we present a useful framework is designed for human robot interactions. Then I will explain the framework design. Uh, we developed the framework through five steps, goals, hardware components, and HR scenarios, uh, framework architectures, data abstracting process, and task state models. We define what the framework must satisfy as a design goal. First, we each part of the framework should consist of modular architecture. The structure should be simple. And third is it should be comparable with various robots. And it should be open source and distributed. Finally, it should be data-driven system. Uh, this is a hardware component. Our environment consists of two main parts. One is the external sensor system to recognize to uh, humans coordinate. And the other is robot platforms. The robot uses two platforms with 3 DOS and 5 DOS. And we consider three HRI scenarios. Uh, first is greeting. Greeting is an interaction scenario based on social distance. Elicit interest is a scenario which, in which a robot attracts attract human attention on the certain situation. Information acquisition and tra transmission is a scenario that obtain information from human speech and provide useful information to human. Uh, this is our framework architecture. Our framework consists of five parts, perception, planning, interface, dialogue, and action. Each has a role that fits the name, uh, and details of the role can be found in the, in the paper paper. Each engine is managed as an independent repository. Communication between nodes uh, is collectively managed by several standardized protocols. This slide shows data abstracting process and task to state model. Data from sensors in various environments are processed into information for the test model through the data abstracting process. And the task state model uh, synthesize the information to determine the next robot task. Uh, this is a result. Uh, this picture is capture of the actual demonstration video using a 5DF robot. Uh, from the top left, first part is real-time navigation in sensor network. Second is the view of the robot front camera. Uh, third part is the GUI that show current state of the robot task. And the biggest part is screen, they show the actual interaction. And the rest part is a status window, they show abstract data. Uh, we have uh, implemented the framework and also we demonstrate the framework. Through the demonstration, we are able to confirm that our framework achieved the design goal and was working properly. Uh, because of a uh, short a presentation time, uh, I, can, um, I can show you a full video. If you are curious about the full video demonstration, please check the link below. Um, we presented a framework design that can be useful in human robot interaction. And by actually implementing the framework, we confirm that it can work well in real environment. And also we plan to um, more uh, to develop the framework in the future. Thank you for listening. Yeah, and the next presentation is from Dr. Uri Ko uh, from Atri. Uh, She's gonna talk about the end-to-end -end learning-based non-verbal behavior generation of social robots. Actually, I recorded the presentation video, so I'll play the video. Okay. Good morning. My name is Uri Ko, and I'm a senior researcher working at Etri in Korea. Today, I will brief you on my research progress on non-verbal behavior generation of social robots. For social robots, it is important to generate non-verbal behaviors such as handshakes. 
But the traditional approaches of replaying the pre-coded motions allow users to easily predict the robot's reaction, so giving the impression that the robot is a machine, not a real agent. So, to enable social robots to learn human-like behaviors from human-human interactions, we propose an end-to-end -end learning-based behavior generation method. This is our neural network model, which consists of an encoder and a decoder. The encoder takes the sequence of user poses U as input and outputs the vector Z. This vector Z encapsulates the information for all input elements. Then the decoder is initialized based on this vector Z, and it outputs the next robot poses R bar, corresponding to the current robot pose R. By repeating this process in real time, robot behavior can be generated. For training the model, we used Air Act to Act dataset, which is a human human interaction dataset. The seven scenarios we used are listed in the table. From the dataset, the robot behaviors that we wanted to learn are bowing, staring, shaking hands, hugging, and avoiding. And the number of extracted data for training and test is over 100,000. After training the model, we performed two experiments using a pepper robot in a simulator. In the first experiment, we tested the behavior generation in the seven scenarios. And in the video, the left side shows the user behavior which is used as input of our model, and the right side shows the robot behavior which is generated from our model. The robot behavior generated in each scenario is as follows. If the user comes home, the robot bows to him. And if the user walks around without a purpose, the robot stares at him. If the user stands still, the robot stares at him too. If the user lifts his arm to shake hands, the robot shakes hands with him. And if the user cries, the robot stretches his hands to hug him. And if the user threatens to hit, threatens to hit, the robot blocks the face with arms. And if the user turns back and walks to the door, the robot bows to him. The second experiment shows the robot behaviors generated when a user stretches his hand to different positions for handshake. To the center, to left position, to right position, to upper position, and to lower position. In this video, the robot could adjust his behavior corresponding to the user's hand positions. Now, I'd like to sum up my presentation with the following conclusions. We propose an end-to-end -end learning-based method for generating non-verbal behaviors of social robots. Two experiments were carried out, and the results show that the robot can generate multiple social behaviors corresponding to the human behavior and adjust this behavior according to the user posture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a single question to Dr. Uriko. Okay, I'm gonna give you one question here. So uh, it's good to see uh, the motion understanding depending on the position of the hand hands here. Uh, yeah. How do how do you distinguish? Uh, we, they're gonna they're gonna do a different greetings, for example, handshake or just a, you know, the, just a waving their hands or bow, bowing. So it might be quite different. So do you also distinguish your different type of the greetings here? Uh, actually, uh, my method is an end-to-end -end learning method. So the robots learn directly from data. So uh, all data is in the data set. So uh, the robot can learn every uh, skills for distinguishing uh, like in from the data. 
I see. So you mean if you if you if you include all different type of the greetings, then you can trend, uh, yes. you can make the model That's right. change. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Now we're gonna have the next presentation here uh, from Dr. Uh, Myung Cho from Atri. Uh, pipe paper is a real, real world verification of a human care robot for the elderly, a uh, primary result. You see my presentation? Sorry. Yeah, yes, yes I, we can see. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leon Cho. I talk about real world verification of human care robot for the elderly opinion results. The number of elder people has increased rapidly in recent years, and many of them live alone at home or in a hospital. So physical support is important for elder people living alone. However, cognitive supportive service or uh, emotional support service to elevate aloneness, sorry, are uh, also important. So this, uh, this study focused on the service design to provide the customized service to the elderly. And we analyzed the problems encountered during the demonstration and review the usefulness of the human care robot service. We have developed 12 uh, technologies such as facial attribute recognition, outfit recognition, or uh, daily activity recognition based on the data set collected from the elderly participants. Uh, uh, we defined 10 services are likely to be needed by the elderly. The type of uh, service is largely divided into uh, a regular service and a request service. Regular service uh, robot first recognizes to the user's actions or speech and responds to them. And request service is a service based on the, the request from the user. Uh, each service uh, contains the one or more uh, element technology. We define the service in, in a such way <coughs> the user can handle the details of the technology. Mm. For the demonstration, an apartment type test bed was built to simulate a real life uh, residential environment. The human care robot is named Jenny and was designed to uh, provide the care for uh, elder, uh, elder people living alone at home. Uh, a, type, a total of 20 uh, older individuals with no problem in daily life were, were tested. Uh, we create 25 uh, scenarios based on the 10 services uh, for the elderly. Uh, each scenario was briefly explained and then performed in order. This slide shows the results. The average uh, success rate is like this. Uh, it is a difference depending on the service. The service based on the user's uh, request generally had a high success rate, but the regular service uh, S01, S02 had a low success rate. Mm -hmm. Um, in this study, uh, we analyzed the result of demonstrating a uh, human care robot for uh, elder and the problems of each service. In the future, we intend to improve the success rate of regular service by analyzing the individual uh, technologies within the service. Actually, explain is not over yet, uh, continuous <laughs> until now. So uh, we hope get the more detailed results after uh, finishing the demonstration. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah, we're gonna have a single question. Okay, then probably I can give you one question. So uh, it's good to see the result there. And it's the 
there is a quite significant difference between the two groups. And you said yes. uh, the you're gonna improve the performance for the S, for example, S01 and S02. Yes. Do you yes. do you, can you can you could could you please share us the, the reason why uh, that group has lower performance? Uh, yeah. As I mentioned, the S01, S01, S01 and S02 uh, robot first uh, recognize human actions. Uh, however, uh, other request services uh, based on the request from the user. So it, it was a difference. Okay, then how, how do you have any plan to improve uh, the one? How do you uh, improve them? Yes. Uh, uh, we will uh, improve. Uh, yeah. Uh, first, we need to improve the individual technology and then uh, combine the. Uh, it's, uh, to guys, we will uh, improve the service. The uh, uh, I see, I see, I see. So you need another uh, improvement for the previous uh, the engine that came in. Okay. Yes, yes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And Dr. Min Su Chang. Okay. Now we have one last paper by Deborah John Johansson from the University of Auckland. The title is The Effect of Attention, Humor, and Empathy Behaviors by a Healthcare Robot on User Perceptions and Behaviors. Um, unfortunately, she could not make it here in real time. So we have a presentation video, which will be played by Professor An. Please, Professor An. My name is Dr. Deborah Johansson, and for the past three years, my colleagues and I from the University of Auckland have been studying the ways in which we can improve interactions with healthcare robots. And today I'm going to be taking you through a very brief presentation of three studies we undertook examining the effect of robot attention, humor, and empathy behaviors on user perceptions and behaviors. So a healthcare robot is a type of social assistive robot that is designed with the goal of enhancing or maintaining a person's health or quality of life through services such as medication reminders or provision of health education. When considering healthcare robots specifically, these robots are designed to interact with individuals who are unwell, injured, or compromised in some way. And it is therefore critical and ethical that researchers ensure that healthcare robots will not be behaving in ways that cause additional stress to these individuals. So the first study that I'm going to talk through aimed to investigate the effect of a healthcare robot receptionist using attentional behaviors such as self-disclosure, voice pitch changes, and forward lean on participant perceptions and behaviors. So in this study, 181 participants were randomized to one of four conditions, a condition in which the robot used self-disclosure statements such as, I forget things too sometimes, a condition in which the robot used a forward lean when listening to participants speak, a condition in which the robot used voice pitch changes and a neutral condition in which none of these behaviors were demonstrated. Following the interaction with the robot, participants completed self-report measures of engagement, perceived robot empathy and perceived robot attention. Interactions were also video recorded and participant eye gaze, forward lean and laughing behaviors were examined. The robot that we used for this study was the robot now. The robot now is autonomous, programmable, and was chosen due to its ability to demonstrate a forward lean behavior. Participants were asked to imagine that they were visiting their local GP's clinic and that the robot now was the robot medical receptionist that was going to be helping them. All interactions with the robot were scripted and involved the participant collecting a prescription script, checking in for their doctor's appointment, asking about the wait time until their appointment, and asking for directions to the bathroom. So when we analyzed results, we found no significant differences between groups in regards to overall engagement, perceived robot empathy, or perceived robot attention. 
However, when analyzing individual items of the engagement scale, we found that participants rated the robot significantly more boring and unstimulating when it used voice pitch changes, as opposed to any of the other groups. A potential explanation for this lack of findings in regards to the self-report measures in this study may have been the use of a twin subjects design. The majority of participants in the study had never interacted with any kind of robot prior to this experiment, and it may have been that this lack of comparison resulted in a lack, oh sorry, this lack of experience rated, resulted in a lack of comparison when completing measures. Another explanation may have been the novelty of interacting with a robot for the first time. Many participants shared their excitement with me before the experiment, and total scores for participant engagement and perceived robot attention were positively skewed. So then we looked at the participants' behaviors and we found some interesting results. Participants in the forward lean and self-disclosure groups spent significantly more time looking at the robot compared to participants in other groups. Participants in the forward lean group were also significantly more likely to lean towards the robot during the interactions compared to participants in the other groups. Finally, participants in the self-disclosure condition were significantly more likely to laugh during the interaction with the robot. This finding was surprising and not one that we'd set out to measure, and it might have been that participants found the robot self-disclosure to be humorous, in which case we might have been measuring humor as opposed to self-disclosure in this condition. The second study we undertook aimed to investigate the effect of a healthcare robot nurse's use of humor on participant perceptions and behaviors. This study involved 91 participants that were randomized to one of two conditions a condition in which the robot used humor or a neutral condition in which humor was absent. In order to minimize the novelty effects as found in the previous study and to give participants a basis of comparison, an initial interaction with the robot was introduced, followed by time point one or baseline measures before participants were randomized to group. Time point one and time point two measures were identical and measured participant perceptions of robot intelligence, likability, animacy, anthropomorphism, safety, empathy, and personality. Participants were also observed and laughing behaviors were recorded. And the robot we used for this study was the Ever4. The Ever4 robot was able to function autonomously, recognizing and responding to participants' comments with pre-programmed speech. She was also able to demonstrate a smile. The current study differed from the first study in that the robot played the part of a practice nurse rather than a medical receptionist. Having the robot act as a general practice nurse allowed for a more in-depth influenza-related medical scenario, an interaction which would have been inappropriate for a medical receptionist to undertake. As with the previous studies, both interactions with the robot were scripted, and participants were asked to imagine they were at their local GP's clinic. The first interaction involved the robot informing the participant about the medical clinic and the services offered by the clinic. The second interaction involved the nurse robot advising the participant about the influenza virus, ways in which to protect against contracting the virus, as well as medical information related to the influenza vaccine. The nurse robot also helped participants book in for an appointment to have the influenza vaccine administered. In the condition in which the robot used humor, additional phrases such as, I caught a computer virus once and it was terrible, that'll teach me to use a strange computer's flash drive, were used during conversation with participants. And so what we found is that the humor, the humorous robot, sorry, had a significant positive effect on participant perceptions. The humorous robot was rated significantly higher in terms of likability, empathy, and safety. The humorous robot was also rated significantly higher in terms of animacy. However, lower animacy scores at time point one for the humor condition might explain this. In regards to personality items, the humorous robot was significantly more likely to be rated happy, humorous, sociable, talkative, warm, popular, and imaginative, but it was also significantly more likely to be wrote, rated as frivolous compared to the non-humorous robot. Finally, we found significant differences in regards to participant laughing behaviors, with participants in the condition in which humor was used laughing significantly more than participants in the neutral condition. The final study I'm going to go over today aimed to investigate the effect of a healthcare robot's nurse using verbal and nonverbal clinical empathy behaviors on participant perceptions. Unlike the previous studies that I've gone over, this study was unable to utilize a face to face interaction between participants and the robot due to social distancing restrictions that had been introduced in the wake of the COVID 19 pandemic. 
Instead, in this study, 100 participants were randomized to view one of four video interactions between a nurse robot and a patient. In these video, the nurse robot either used verbal empathy and non-verbal empathy, which was demonstrated as head nodding, verbal empathy only, non-verbal empathy only, so head nodding only, and a neutral condition in which none of these behaviors were seen. Following um, the, sorry, following randomization to condition, participants completed measures of empathy, trust, and satisfaction. They were also asked whether they would want to interact with the robot face to face. As with the previous study, an initial interaction video was introduced in order to reduce novelty, as well as to give a basis of comparison for participants. So the robot used for this study was the NOW robot. The initial interaction video involved the nurse robot responding to a patient's queries about a health check and what this involved. The second interaction video involved the nurse robot taking the patient's blood pressure as part of the health check. During this interaction, the patient also talked to the nurse about their emotional state and how they were feeling about their symptoms. In the condition in which the robot used verbal empathy, it responded to the patient with statements such as, that sounds really hard. I can imagine anyone in your situation would wanna get some answers. In conditions in which the robot used non, sorry, did not use verbal empathy, it used statements such as, a lot of patients experience fatigue and sleep issues. In conditions in which the robot used head nodding as a demonstration of non-verbal empathy, it was found to nod at the patient when the patient was talking about their feelings. So for example, when the patient said, I'm really tired, I just need some answers, the robot was seen to nod. And so what we found was that verbal empathy had a significant effect on participant perceptions with participants rating the robot significantly higher in terms of empathy, satisfaction, and trust in conditions in which verbal empathy was used. The robot was also rated significantly lower in terms of robot distrust in conditions in which verbal empathy was used. We found no significant effect of head nodding on any outcome, and it might have been that this behavior was just not exaggerated enough for a video format. And we found no significant interaction effects between head nodding and verbal empathy. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. So we're gonna we're gonna closing our workshop today. So again, okay, thanks again for your time and contribution on the workshop today. It's great to keep continuing our workshop. Actually, uh, this is already eighth workshop. Actually, we are uh, running a work our workshop series from two thousand seventeen. So one, two, three workshops every year. Okay. And we also run the conference special session series as well, focused you know, in the UR and the Roman especially. Uh, and also we invited some uh, uh, good papers from our workshop and the special sessions for making a special issue on the different journals here. So we all, we prepared all the special issues from 2019, and now we are finalizing some of them. And next year, yeah, hopefully we can see you in person. But yeah, who knows? So uh, basically, based on our uh, histories, uh, we're gonna prepare our online sessions or offline sessions of the workshop and the special sessions at uh, HRI. ICSR, IROS, and or Loman. Okay. So please join us uh, uh, by sharing your emails with us. You can, you can share your emails with me or the, uh, Dr. Zhang. Okay. Yeah. And especially we want to advertise the Loman 2023, which is happening in Busan in 2023. So I'm gonna invite uh, uh, Dr. Jung Seok Che, who is the general chair of the Roman 2023. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Jung Seok Che. Uh, yeah, um, people are introducing the Roman 2023. Uh, I'd like to thank you, the um, you know, main two organizers, Dr. Min Chang and Professor Ho To An for your hard work for this great uh, workshop. Uh, and also today, today, you know, we had a great invi invited talk. Uh, thanks all the invited speakers. 
And lots of uh, ongoing and work, uh, work in progress uh, teasing represented. So uh, I just thank all again, uh, the older contributors. And oh, uh, surprisingly, uh, I saw the, um, uh, we, today we have more than 20 participants in this workshop. Wow. <laughs> thank <laughs> all of your uh, great uh, contribution for making this workshop so fruitful and fantastic. Okay, uh, before closing, uh, as uh, Professor Ho Sok An, uh, I'd like to introduce you, uh, Roman 2023. Um, um, can I can I share Do you see? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, there are uh, some uh, big conferences uh, regarding the human over interaction. The Roman is one of that conferences, uh, especially Roman 2023 will be held uh, in Busan, Korea. Uh, you know, um, Busan is the uh, second largest in Korea and wonderful city uh, because you know uh, Busan has uh, lots of great hotel and uh, is located nearby the, uh, the beautiful beach, uh, beautiful ocean. And uh, uh, Dr. Actually, Chef, can you, yeah, the slide sharing is not properly working now, oh, really? I think. Yes, we cannot see your presentation. Yes, this, this is okay. Oh, okay, you can see. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, Busan is also uh, has also a lot of connection uh, from the international city, and uh, especially in Busan, uh, the conference will be held in Paradise Hotel, uh, which is a very famous uh, hotel in Busan because uh, it has a beautiful uh, beach, Heaven the Beach, just in front of the hotel, so we can enjoy the good. Uh, uh, good sighting and good uh, scene, uh, this hotel. Okay, uh, and also it you know, has lots of facilities and you can uh, enjoy, you can look around uh, the hotel in Busan and several places which is famous uh, in terms of historic or in terms of uh, lots of things. And we are considering uh, both possibilities on-site or hybrid uh, conference. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, lots of contributors can come and can uh, discuss and can present their own research results in this conference. And uh, we are considering uh, lots of uh, technical tours or cultural tours. Yep. Um, um, I'm uh, in charge of this uh, Roman conference, and uh, even though uh, there are not uh, uh, so many uh, members fixed, uh, I I think Dr. Vince Chang and Professor Hosogan will serve uh, for this Roman 2023, uh, surely. Okay. Um, thank you again. Uh, I expect and I hope. Uh, to see all of you uh, in near future conference, including this Roman 2023, we can keep sharing and communicating. Uh, uh, and uh, I think next time we can have a more progressive and more fruitful uh, research result. Okay. Okay. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.